باب في السهو وسجود السهو في الصلاة سنة فللنقصان سجدتان قبل السلام بعد تمام التشهدين يزيد بعدهما تشهدا آخر والزيادة سجدتان بعد السلام يتشهد بعدهما ويسلم تسليمة أخرى The prostration of forgetfulness in the prayer is a sunnah Should it be due to omission then it is performed by two prostrations before the salam upon completion of the two tashahuds. One should add an extra tashahud after the prostrations. If the reason was addition, then two prostrations should be performed after the final salam, and again perform an additional tashahud after the two prostrations, and then add an additional salam to exit the prayer. The prostration of forgetfulness in the prayer is a sunnah. So the hukum of the prostration of forgetfulness. If a person makes a mistake in the prayer out of forgetfulness, and he has to address it, then he's going to either prostrate before the salam or after the salam. And that prostration is going to be twice. And the hukum of this prostration for making a mistake is that it is a sunnah. Should it be due to omission, meaning if he subtracts something from the prayer and that something is two or more sunnahs, two or more of the confirmed sunnahs, of the eight confirmed sunnahs of the prayer, then it is performed by two prostrations before the salam upon the completion of the tashahuds. If he realizes that he has subtracted two or more of the eight confirmed sunnahs in the prayer, then he's going to prostrate twice before the salam. And he would do this once he's completed the tahiyyat, once he's completed the the salat al-Ibrahimiyyah, once he's completed his dua, in the place where he would normally say the salam, now it's about time for him to say salam, then he prostrates twice, just like a normal prostration. And then after that, he would do another tashahud, but he would only go up to the saying Abduhu wa Rasuluhu from the Tahiyyat and then he would say the Salam. So for that reason Imam al-Akhdari says one should add an extra Tashahud after the prostrations. Meaning after the two prostrations of the, of the, of the Sahu you would do another Tashahud and then say your Salam. If the reason was addition then two prostrations should be performed after the Salam. So if the person in his prayer mistakenly added an obligation. Now this addition is an addition of an obligation, not of a sunnah. If he added an obligation, he prostrated three times instead of twice. He added a fifth rak'ah to dhuhr. He added two ruku'ahs. He did a ruku'ah once, he did it twice, and this is all done out of a mistake. Then he would do a ba'di, two prostrations after the salam. So he would go through his prayer, he would continue on in his prayer, do the tahiyyat, do the salat al-ibrahimiyya, make his dua, then say the salam, and then do prostrate twice. And then after those two prostrations, and again perform an additional tashahud after the two prostrations. Do another tashahud, and then say the salam. And then add an additional salam to exit the prayer. So if he added something, say somebody mistakenly added an extra sajda to his prayer. Instead of doing two sajdas, in one of the ruku, uh, rak'as, he did three, or he did four. So now he has... A- accidentally added an obligation to the prayer. So now he completes his prayer, and then after the prayer he prostrates twice, does another tashahud, again only up to abduhu wa rasuluhu, wa ashhadu anna muhammadan abduhu wa rasuluhu, and then he would say the salam, and now his prayer is complete. وَمَنْ نَقَصَ وَزَادَ سَجَدَ قَبْلَ السَّلَامِ وَمَنْ نَسِيَ السُّجُودَ الْقَبْلِيَّ حَتَّى سَلَّمَ سجد إن كان قريبا وإن طال أو خرج من المسجد بطل السجود وتبطل الصلاة معه إن كان على ثلاث سنن أو أكثر من ذلك وإلا فلا تبطل ومن نسي السجود البعدية سجده ولو بعد عام Should one omit and commit Should one add something to the prayer and subtract in the prayer in the same prayer then two prostrations before the salam are in order Should one forget the قبلي and actually perform the salam, then he should perform the prostration if not too much time has elapsed. Should a reasonable amount of time elapse or he leave the mosque, then not only is the prostration of redress invalid, but the prayer is invalidated also in the case that three or more sunan were omitted. If they were less than three, in, then, uh, then the prayer is valid. Should one forget the post-salam prostration, uh, they should redress it even after a year. So he began by discussing the, the, the qabli, and when it should be prostrated, and the ba'di, and when it should be prostrated. So, then he mentions the case of when somebody adds and subtracts. 
So should somebody add and subtract in the same prayer, then two prostrations before the salam in order. So if somebody does something in the prayer that requires a qabli, and he also does something that requires a ba'di, then the subtraction would override the addition, and he would do a qabli, a salam prostration, and it would suffice for both, for both prostrations. Should one forget the qabli and then perform the salam, then he should perform the prostration if not too much time has elapsed. So the qabli is called a qabli because it's done before the salam. You're prostrating before the salam for the subtraction. If a person owes the qabli and he forgets to do it, and he says assalamu alaikum, and then he realizes he needs to prostrate a qabli, then if not too much time has elapsed, or if he hasn't left the masjid, then he goes ahead and prostrates the qabli, and his prayer is sound. And not too much time, um, when it says not too much time, the fuqaha did not give an exact definition. They would say just by uh, what the urf, by what the custom dictates is something not long. So if a person has just said assalamu alaikum, began his dhikr after the prayer, and uh, uh, just r very close afterwards he realizes it, he goes ahead and prostrates. Whereas if now he's, he's finished his dhikr or he began talking to somebody or if he left his masjid, then that would be a reasonable, uh, um, uh, a, long, uh, a large amount of time. So if, it, if he says assalamu alaikum, then remembers to do the qabli and it's still close by, he hasn't, uh, a long time has not passed, then he can prostrate the qabli. Whereas should a reasonable amount of time elapse or he leave the mosque, then not only is the prostration of redress invalid, but the prayer is invalid also in the case that three or more sunan were omitted. So if a long time does pass, then, then, then he cannot uh, prostrate the qabli. It's, uh, it's invalidated. But his prayer may or may not be invalidated. He says that in the case that three or more sunan were omitted, then the prayer would be invalid. So if a person left three of the confirmed sunnas of the prayer, then he has to prostrate the qabli. If he doesn't, and he leaves the prayer, then his, and he forgets to prostrate it, and then a long time passes, and he, does not prost, uh, um, uh, he has not prostrated the qabli, then the, prayer, the, the, the sujood of qabli is invalid, and the prayer is invalid too, because he missed three sunans of the prayer, and he should have prostrated the qabli. If they were less than three, meaning two sunnah, then the prayer is valid. So if a person missed two sunnahs of the prayer and owed a qabli and he forgot to prostrate it, and then he said assalamu alaikum, and a long time passed, then the prostration of, of uh, the qabli is invalid, he can't go back and make it up, but the prayer is valid. And he's going to mention if it's, uh, if it's only one sunnah, then there's no prostration. So a person's either in his prayer going to miss one sunnah, two sunnahs, or three sunnahs. If he misses one sunnah, there's no qabli. If he misses two sunnahs, there's a qabli, but if he forgets to do it, his prayer is valid. And if he misses three sunnahs, then he has to do the qabli. And if he forgets to do it and a long time passes after the salam, then his prayer is invalid. Should one forget the ba'di, the post-salam prostration, that should be redressed even after a year. So if a person does something, adds something to the prayer, and now he's required to uh, prostrate a ba'di, but he forgets to do it after the salam, then no matter how long passes after that, he still prostrates the ba'di. So the prayer is valid, and as soon as he remembers it, he um, makes sure that he's in a state of uh, purity. He's facing the qibla from a seated position. He says, Allahu Akbar. And he goes into the uh, he goes into the prostration. Allahu Akbar and comes out and does two salams and then a tashahud and then he says assalamu alaikum. Even after a year, even after five years, if a person realizes now that they had prayed a prayer a year ago and they had added something to that prayer, and they need to do a ba'di, then they can do the ba'di right now. وَمَنْ نَقَصَ فَرِيضَةً فَلَا يُجْزِئُهُ السُّجُودُ عَنْهَا وَمَنْ نَقَصَ الْفَضَائِلَ فَلَا سُجُودَ عَلَيْهِ وَلَا يَكُونُ السُّجُودُ الْقَبْلِيُّ إِلَّا لِتَرْكِ سُنَّتَيْنِ فَأَكْثَرَ Whoever omits an obligation in the prayer, it is not redressed by prostration. No prostration is necessary if any of the meritorious acts of the prayer were omitted. Moreover, one need only do a pre-salam prostration, a qabli, if he has omitted two or more sunnah. So, in this chapter, he's talking about subtraction of something from the prayer. And when he says subtraction, he means specifically a, a subtracting a, a confirmed sunnah from the prayer. Whereas the obligation, he says, whoever omits an obligation in the prayer is, is not redressed by, uh, it is not redressed by, prostrate, uh, by prostration. Uh, 
So if somebody says, well, I can do a qabli for subtracting something to the prayer. I forgot to do one rak'ah or I forgot to read, um, uh, I forgot to do uh, a sajda in my first, I forgot to do one of the prostrations in my first rak'ah or I forgot to go to, into the court for my third rak'ah. I forgot an obligation, whatever it was. He cannot do a qabli. He has to redress that. And in the... Um, Later on in this section, he'll discuss how a person fixes his prayer once he's forgotten an obligation. But missing an obligation cannot be addressed by the qabli. The qabli is only specifically for missing two or more sunnah. No prostration is necessary if any of the meritorious acts of the prayer were omitted. So we, uh, again, he's, he's um, stressing that the, the qabli is only for missing a sunnah. If a person misses a fard, he says he doesn't prostrate it. And also, if he misses a recommended act, one of the fadail, one of the mandubat, then there's no prostration. So in the case of missing an obligation, if he prostrates the qabli, then his prayer is invalid because he has not addressed it properly. And in the case of missing a mandub action, a recommended action, if he prostrates the qabli, then his prayer is invalid because his addition of this qabli to the prayer is as if he's an added an, um, a, a pillar, which is the prostration is a pillar. So by now adding uh, a qabli to the prayer, two prostrations, he's added um, something to the prayer that's not supposed to be there, and so that invalidates the prayer. Because any addition, addition to the prayer of a pillar, whether it's in, if it's intentional or if it's done out of ignorance, then it would invalidate the prayer. So this, this section is only talking about the chapter of forgetfulness. A, a person forgets something from his prayer, forgets and adds something, then he can address it. But if he intentionally adds an extra rak'ah or an extra sajda, or if he intentionally uh, subtracts an obligation, then his prayer is invalid. Here we're specifically talking about missing something due to forgetfulness. Moreover, one need only do a pre-salam prostration if he has omitted two or more sunan. So if a person has omitted, omitted two or more sunnas, that's the case where he would do a qabli. Whereas uh, one sunnah, the author then mentions, وَأَمَّا السُنَّةُ الْوَاحِدَةُ فَلَا سُجُودَ لَهَا إِلَّا السِّرَّ وَالْجَهْرَ فَمَنْ السَّرَّ فِي الْجَهْرِ سَجَدَ قَبْلَ السَّلَامِ وَمَنْ جَهْرَ فِي السِّرِّ سَجَدَ بَعْدَ السَّلَامِ As for the omission of one sunnah, then there is no prostration required. So if a person misses one sunnah, he misses one سَمِعَ اللَّهُ لِمِنْ حَمِيدًا He misses one Allahu Akbar when going into ruku or sujood or so forth. If he only missed one, then there's no prostration required. And if he does it, does do a prostration, then his prayer is invalid. If he misses two or more, that's where he does the qabli. But there is one exception to this rule, and that is unless it was either reciting silently for a vocal prayer or vocally for a silent prayer. Thus, should one recite silently for a vocal prayer, he needs to prostrate before the salam, whereas if he was vocal for a silent prayer, then he needs to prostrate after the salam. So, as he mentioned in the section on the sunnah of the prayer, one of the sunnahs of the prayer is in the recitation of the Fatiha and the recitation of the Surah, reciting out loud where appropriate and silently where appropriate is considered a sunnah of the prayer. So in, the, uh, in reading a Surah, reading the Surah is a sunnah. Reading it while standing is a sunnah and reading it out loud at night and the, um, uh, where appropriate and silently where appropriate is also a sunnah. So if somebody switches those around, if he forgets and recites out loud in Dhuhr or Asr, or he recites silently in Maghrib or Isha, then he, um, he, would, he would address that with a prostration. So this is the only case where if a person misses one sunnah, then he would, he would, uh, he would prostrate. So, if he was vocal for a silent prayer, then he would, um, if one should, re uh, uh, thus should one recite silently for a vocal prayer, he needs to prostrate before the salam. So if he recites silently for a vocal prayer, he's praying Maghrib or Isha or the Subah prayer, and he recites silently. He should have been reciting out loud, but he recited silently. In that case, he would prostrate before the salam. He would prostrate a qabli. Because it's as if he's subtracted something from the prayer. Whereas if he was vocal for a silent prayer, then he needs to prostrate after the salam. If he was vocal for a silent prayer, like in Dhuhr or Asr, or in the last two rak'ahs of Isha, he should have been reciting silently, but he forgot and he recited out loud. So in that case, it's as if he's added something and he would do a ba'di. Now this is where he talks about reciting silently for a vocal prayer. This is if he's reciting so silently that he can't even hear himself. Whereas if he can, um, he can at least he can hear himself. 
then there would be no prostration for that. وَمَنْ تَكَلَّمَ سَاهِيًا سَجَدَ بَعْدَ السَّلَامِ وَمَنْ سَلَّمَ مِنْ رَكْعَتَيْنِ سَاهِيًا سَجَدَ بَعْدَ السَّلَامِ وَمَنْ زَادَ فِي الصَّلَاةِ رَكْعَتَنَا وَرَكْعَتَيْنِ سَجَدَ بَعْدَ السَّلَامِ وَمَنْ زَادَ فِي الصَّلَاةِ مِثْلَهَا بَطَلَتْ Should one speak unwittingly in the prayer, then he would prostrate after the salam. Should one say salam after only two rak'ah, then he should prostrate after the salam. Should one perform one or two extra rak'ah, then he should prostrate after the salam. But should the extra rak'ah exceed the number of the rak'ah in the actual prayer, his prayer is invalidated. So if a person in the prayer speaks unwittingly, he accidentally says something. He sees somebody, his child is about to grab something, something from the, from the stove, and he yells out at them, forgetting that, he's in a, uh, that, he, that he shouldn't speak. Um, or he sees somebody, somebody comes in and he, and, he, and he talks to them just out of reflex. Or somebody says, uh, greets him and he responds, uh, he responds to the greeting out of reflex. He does this uh, uh, unwittingly, then he would prostrate after the salam. So his prayer is valid, but he, w- he would have to prostrate after the salam. Now, if a person spoke, in, uh, spoke intentionally, then it, his prayer would be invalid. So this is only specifically talking about a person that speaks unwittingly in the prayer. Now, in the case that I mentioned about, say, a parent sees their child about to do something, they're about to walk down the stairs and they fear that they might fall, or they're, um, they're about to grab something from the stove, or they're, um, somebody's, about to steal, you know, somebody's about to steal their money, then in those situations where a person fears loss of, uh, of, of life, or loss of somebody's health, uh, or loss of wealth, then in those situations he, can't, he, he, has, he has to leave the prayer. So he would speak, and he, and he, he leaves the prayer, and he saves that person, saves that wealth, but his prayer is, in, is invalid. So this is, if a person speaks unwittingly in the prayer, even if it's only one letter, he would prostrate after the salam. Should one perform one or two extra rak'ah, then he should prostrate after the salam. If a person is in prayer, and he just he forgets how many um, he, he he forgets and he keeps praying and then he realizes he has now added one complete rak'ah or he's added two complete rak'ahs. Then in that case, if it was done unintentionally, he prostrates after the salam because it's an addition. Also, right before that, he mentioned, should one say salam after only two rak'ah, then he should prostrate after the salam. So he gives the example of a person saying salam after two rak'ah. And this would be from, say, a Maghrib or Isha or a Luhr prayer or in Subh if he says Salam after one rak'ah. The point is he says, he says Assalamu Alaikum, he leaves the prayer before his prayer is actually complete. If this was done unintentionally, he just sat down and he said Assalamu Alaikum and then he realized that he has left the prayer and he has not completed it, then what he would do from that seated position, he would say Allahu Akbar to go back into the prayer and then he would stand up and complete his prayer, how many, however many rak'ahs he owes. And then after the prayer, after he says assalamu alaikum now, he, he does a ba'di. He does a post-salam prostration because of the addition. Because of the addition of the salam and the takbir. Because he left the prayer, so he did assalamu alaikum. And then he had to come back in, he had to do another takbir of ihram, um, an opening takbir to get back into the prayer. So now he's added those two things to the prayer. So for that, he would prostrate after the prayer. If he prostrates intentionally, after realizing that his prayer is not complete, then his prayer is invalid. So this is only specifically talking about a person that prostrates um, before completing the prayer and he does it unintentionally. So uh, back to the, if a person adds one or two rak'ahs to the prayer, then he would prostrate after the salam. But should the, act, uh, should, should the extra rak'ah exceed the number of rak'ah in the actual prayer, his prayer is invalid. So if he unintentionally adds the uh, same amount of the prayer to the prayer, then his prayer is invalid. So in Dhuhr prayer, for example, if he keeps praying and then he realizes that he has now prayed eight rak'ahs, he has doubled the amount of the prayer, then his prayer is invalid. Or in the Subah prayer, he now realizes he's prayed four rak'ahs, then his prayer is invalid. So in the case of adding one or two rak'ahs to Dhuhr or three rak'ahs, unintentionally he would prostrate after the salam. But if he goes now and adds the same number of the prayer to the prayer unintentionally, then his prayer wouldn't be his prayer would be invalid. وَمَن شَكَّ فِي كَمَالِ صَلَاتِهِ أَتَى بِمَا شَكَّ فِيهِ وَالشَّكُّ فِي في النُّقْصَانِ كَتَحَقُّقِهِ فَمَن شَكَّ فِي رَكْعَةٍ أَوْ سَجْدَةٍ أَتَى بِهَا وَسَجَدَ بَعْدَ السَّلَامِ وَإِنْ شَكَّ فِي السَّلَامِ سَلَّمَ إِنْ كَانَ قَرِيبًا وَلَا سُجُودَ عَلَيْهِ وَإِنْ طَالَ بَطَلَتْ صَلَاتُهُ 
Whoever doubts whether he has completed his prayer or not should perform what he doubts. This is based on the principle that doubt about omission is like confirming it. Thus, whomever doubts whether he has performed the rak'ah or prostration, he should perform the rak'ah and then prostrate after the salam. Should he have doubt about the final salam itself, then he should say it if not, if not much time has elapsed and there is no prostration binding. On the other hand, should time elapse, then the prayer is not valid. Whoever doubts whether he has completed his prayer or not should perform what he doubts. So if a person's in the prayer and now they're in a, they're, they have shik, which is doubt, they don't know, have I prayed three rak'ahs for dhuhr or have I prayed two? He performs what he doubts and completes it. And this is based on the principle that, uh, that anything about, uh, uh, the doubt about omission is like confirming it. So if a person doubts, he says, uh, now he's praying, he's standing, he says, I don't know, this might be the last rak'ah of dhuhr. Or this might be the third rak'ah. Because he has doubt, he considers that it's like, um, he, he, he considers like he has confirmed it. He has confirmed that he is in the third rak'ah. But he, because he has now doubt about this fourth rak'ah, he considers that it's not there. So then he, 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 he adds another rak'ah, and then after the salam, he would prostrate a ba'di because of the possibility of addition. Because in reality, he might have really prayed four, and then added another one, and thus making the prayer a five rak'ah prayer. But there's also the chance that he, he did really just pray three and now he added one, so there's four. So it's either four or five. He either added something or he didn't. But because he has doubt about that, he would prostrate after the salam. And if he, in this situation, if he doubts about the completion of his prayer and says, Assalamu alaikum, his prayer is invalid and he has to start it all over again. So before he completes the prayer, he has to be sure, absolutely sure that he's performed every rak'ah and every obligation of this prayer. And if he has doubt about missing any of those things, then he should, do, then he should uh, address that. Thus, whomever doubts whether he has performed the rak'ah or prostration should perform and then prostrate after the salam. So say a person is standing and he says, I don't know if I just did the rak'ah or not. So he would go ahead and do the rak'ah again or do a rak'ah to be sure that he actually performed it. Or say he's now prostrating and he says, I don't know, is this my first prostration or is this my second prostration? So he would do another prostration just to be sure that he got two prostrations. And then when he, he completes his prayer, he would do a ba'di because of the possibility of addition. And then prostrate after the salam in those situations. Should he have doubt about the final salam itself, then he should say it if not much time has elapsed and there's no prostration binding. If a person is at the end of his prayer, and now he's um, he, he, he's doing his dhikrs, for example. He's left. He 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 believes to have left his prayer, and then he has doubt. Did I even say assalamu alaikum? He doesn't know whether or not he actually left the prayer. So in that case, if not much time has elapsed, then he would just say assalamu alaikum, and there is no prostration binding. On the other hand, should time elapse, then the prayer is not valid. So if a person now um, he's he, he, he a long time has has passed. And, he re and now he thinks, he says, I, I doubt whether I actually said assalamu alaikum to leave this prayer. He thinks that he just finished his tashahud and then started doing his dhikr or started moving on to the next um, some, something else. And he, he didn't do the salam. So if it's, if it's close by, if not much time has elapsed, he goes ahead and prostrates. He says assalamu alaikum and he does not prostrate. And if a long time has passed, then his prayer is invalid. On the other hand, should time elapse, then the prayer is not valid. So now in these um, few, uh, few lines, he was discussing the situations where a person has doubt about the prayer. And this is the shek. And so immediately after, he's going to discuss the section of waswasa, which is constant doubt. Because a person um, the, has to realize the difference between doubt that must be addressed and uh, constant doubt or just whisperings that have to be left. So he says, وَالْمُوَسْوِسُ يَتْرُكُ الْوَسْوَسَةَ مِنْ قَلْبِهِ وَلَا يَاتِي بِمَا شَكَّ فِيهِ وَلَكِنْ يَسْجُدُ بَعْدَ السَّلَامِ سَوَاءٌ مِنْ شَكَّ فِي زِيَادَةٍ أَوْ نُقْصَانٍ وَمَنْ جَهَرَ فِي الْقُنُوتِ فَلَا سُجُودَ عَلَيْهِ وَلَكِنَّهُ يُكْرَهُ عَمْدُهُمْ On the other hand, should uh, or as for the one afflicted with constant doubt, he should ignore the compulsive, uh, compulsive thoughts of his heart and not perform what he has doubt about, but rather prostrate after the salam, whether it is a mission or commission that he has doubts about. So if a person has shik, doubt all the time about his prayer, every single day, at least once a day, he has, he has doubt. That, would, that person now is considered a muwaswis, somebody afflicted with constant doubt. And so for him, it's incumbent for him to, to leave that doubt and not address it. 
But what he would do when experiencing that doubt, he would prostrate after the salam, but not because of maybe missing, uh, adding, or subtracting something from the prayer, but to um, to do it to spite the shaitan, to spite the devil. Because those whisperings in his prayer are from the devil. And so he would leave them, and then he would prostrate um, to, to spite the shaitan. So if a person once in a while forgets that he forgot, he, he says he doubts, he says, I might have added something or I might have subtracted, then he addresses it. But if now this doubt is coming every day, and it's coming every single day consecutively, even if it's only once a day, this person has the hukum of, of the muwaswas, and he would, he would leave that. It's incumbent upon him to leave it, and then he would do a ba'di. And he would do this post-salam prostration, whether it is omission or co uh, commission that he has doubts about, whether it's addition or subtraction that he has doubts about. So if a person, we said, if he subtracts something from the prayer, he does a qabli. And if he adds something to the prayer, he does a ba'di. So a per, but a person with constant doubt, whether he has doubt about adding or subtracting, he would, he would leave that doubt, he would leave addressing that, and he would just do a ba'di after the prayer, whether it was addition or subtraction that he had doubts about, because his prostration is, in reality is not for that possible mistake, that possible addition or subtraction. subtraction. It's done to spite the shaitan. It's a type of uh, medicine to get the shaitan away from him. So the best medicine is to actually, uh, is to never follow it up. If a person is experiencing constant doubt, whether it's in their wudu or their fasting, their purification or their uh, or their psalm or, um, or their prayer, it's incumbent for them to leave that, and then they, in the situation of the prayer, they would um, prostrate a body. And it's a very serious thing, and a lot of people that once they begin studying their, their deen and practicing it, the shaitan will come and, um, and, uh, and do waswasa. If it's a little bit at first, then, uh, then there's, no, there's no problem as long as he gets it away. But if it keeps, if he allows it to grow, then it could actually be problematic because the shaitan is trying to work to his iman, to his aqidah, to do whisperings about his aqidah through these things. Because the shaitan, he knows that he can't go to the average Muslim and go straight to his beliefs and then tamper with his beliefs. So he has to work his way up, starting at the purification, going through the prayer to the fasting and so on, uh, until he gets to his faith. And um, and begins doing waswasa to him, whisperings about his his aqidah. So for that reason, the ulama said that it's incumbent as soon as a person realizes that they're having waswasa to leave it. وَمَنْ جَهَرَ فِي الْقُنُوتِ فَلَا سُجُودَ عَلَيْهِ وَلَكِنَّهُ يُكْرَهُ عَمْدَهُ وَلَكِنَّهُ يُكْرَهُ عَمْدَهُ وَمَنْ زَادَ السُّورَةَ فِي الرَّكْعَتَيْنِ الْأَخِيرَتَيْنِ فَلَا سُجُودَ عَلَيْهِ should one perform the qunut prayer out loud, there is no prostration for this, but it is disliked should it be done intentionally. So the qunut prayer, which, we, uh, which he stated in the section of the recommended actions of the prayer, is a recommended act. If a person does it out loud, then there is no prostration for this. Because the qunut, it's recommended that it be done silently. But if a person reads the qunut out loud, he shouldn't figure, well, I've now read uh, vocally where I should have been silent, so I'm going to do a ba'di. He's saying because that's a recommended action, he has left a, uh, he is he is now left a recommended action. There's no prostration for it, but it's makru should it be done intentionally. So if a person intentionally reads the qunut prayer out loud, it's considered makru because it's recommended that it be done silently. Should one recite an extra surah in the in the third or fourth rak'ah, there's no prostration binding. So now also he's mentioning an example of an addition of a sunnah. So if a person in the third or the fourth rak'ah, uh, it is not considered sunnah to recite a surah. The recitation of a surah being sunnah is only in the first or the second rak'ah. In the third or the fourth rak'ah, he would only recite fatiha. But if he goes and he unintentionally recites a, a surah, and then he realizes, oh, I've now added something to my rak'ah, I have to prostrate a ba'di, he's saying, no, he, he does not prostrate a ba'di because now he has added a sunnah to the prayer. So just like a person would not do a qabli, a pre-salam prostration for subtracting a obligation, a person would also not do a ba'di, a post-salam prostration for the addition of a sunnah. Because the qabli is for the subtraction of a sunnah, and the ba'di is for the addition of a pillar to the prayer, of an obligation. So if he adds a sunnah to the prayer, there's no prostration. وَمَنْ سَمِعَ ذِكْرَ سَيِّدِنَا مُحَمَّدٍ صَلَّى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَّمَ وَهُوَ فِي الصَّلَاةِ فَصَلَّى عَلَيْهِ فَلَا شَيْءَ عَلَيْهِ سَوَاءٌ كَانَ سَاهِنًا أو عَامِدًا أو قَائِمًا أو جَالِسًا وَمَنْ قَرَأَ سُورَتَيْنِ فَأَكْثَرَ فِي رَكْعَةٍ وَاحِدَةٍ أو خَرَجَ مِنْ سُورَةٍ إِلَى سُورَةٍ 
أو ركع قبل تمام السورة فلا شيء عليه في جميع ذلك ومن أشار في في صلاته بيده أو رأسه فلا شيء عليه Should one recite an extra surah in the fir- third or fourth rak'ah, there's no prostration binding. Whoever hears the name of our Master Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa in prayer and invokes blessings upon him, there is no harm in that and nothing binding, whether he does this wittingly or unwittingly, standing or sitting. Whoever recites two or more surah in one rak'ah or moves from one surah to another or performs ruku' before completing the surah, then nothing is binding upon him for any of that. Whoever makes some signal with his hand or head, then there is no harm in that. So whoever hears the name of the Prophet ﷺ in his prayer and invokes blessings upon him, there is no harm in that. So if a person is in the prayer and somebody near him is mentioning the name of our Master Muhammad ﷺ, and he, and he in the prayer says it, he says Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, whatever position of the prayer he was in, and he says Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, there is nothing binding for that. And he's mentioning this because somebody might think, well, that's not a part of the prayer, and so he's now added something, so he needs to address that. He's saying no. If he men- hears the name of the Prophet Muhammad wasallam and invokes a blessing upon him, whether it was intentionally or unintentionally, whether it was, whether it was standing or sitting, whatever the case was, there's no prostration for that. And the same goes also for other types of dhikr that are not specifically um, uh, uh, mentioned as part of the prayer. But if it's, a, if it's a dhikr, adding it would not be considered an addition to the prayer. So for example, if he in the, the ruku' he, he's doing tasbih and he says, La ilaha illallah. Or he says, La ilaha illallah before the fatiha or after. There's no addition, there's no, um, he does not have to do a ba'di for that addition. Whoever recites two or more surah in one rak'ah or moves from one surah to another or performs ruku' before completing the surah, then there's nothing binding upon him for that. So if he says he recites two or more surah in one rak'ah, what he should do is only recite one complete surah in the rak'ah. If he recites more than one surah in one rak'ah, then he um, or moves, um, then there's no there's no nothing binding for that. So a person wouldn't say, well, he's recited two surahs in, in one rak'ah, he's now added something, he owes a ba'di. He's saying no, um, if he adds an extra surah, there's nothing um, uh, upon him for that. Or if he moves from one surah to another, if in the middle of one surah, he stops and then he goes to another surah, also in that situation, there's nothing binding upon that. Or he performs ruku' before completing the surah. So before completing the surah, he does not, um, uh, before completing the surah, he does ruku'ah. Later on in the prayer, he shouldn't say, well, I've now subtracted a part of my sunnah, so I have to do a qabli. He's saying, if, he's, if, if those are the, the, the cases, there's no, uh, nothing binding upon him for that. Because when he, when he says that the prostration of qabli is for missing a sunnah, if he, if he didn't read the surah at all, then that would be considered a subtraction that he should address. But if he reads at least one ayah from the surah, he has completed the sunnah of, of, reciting, of reciting the surah. It's recommended to complete the surah. And he shouldn't recite two or more surahs, and uh, he shouldn't recite two, um, uh, more than one uh, surah in one rak'ah. But if he does do that, if he stops in the middle of a surah and goes to another one, or if he, in the middle of the surah, he does ruku' there's nothing binding upon, upon that. Because he has completed the sunnah by reciting one ayah, and completion of the surah is recommended. So if he doesn't do that recommended act, we don't say, well, he subtracted something, now he has to do a qabli. Whoever makes some signal with his hand or head, there is no harm in that. So if a person's in the prayer, and he wants to get a message across to somebody, and he nods with his head or he, uh, he uh, points with his hand, somebody's looking for something and he points to it, then there's no harm in that, and there's no prostration owed. وَمَنْ كَرَّرَ الْفَاتِحَةَ سَاهِيًا سَجَدَ بَعْدَ السَّلَامِ وَإِنْ كَانَ عَامِدًا فَالظَّاهِرُ الْبُطْلَانِ وَمَنْ تَذَكَّرَ السُّورَةَ بَعْدَ إِنْحِنَائِهِ إِلَى الرُّكُوعِ فَلَا يَرْجِعُ إِلَيْهَا Whoever unwittingly recites the Fatiha twice in the same rak'ah owes a prostration after the salam. Whereas if it was done intentionally, then it would appear the prayer is invalid. Should one re- uh, remember omitting the surah after he has begun to go into ruku' then in that case he should not return to it. So whoever unwittingly recites the Fatiha twice in the same rak'ah owes a prostration after the salam. So if a person recites Fatiha and then accidentally recites it again, 
after once he realizes that he's recited now uh, Fatiha twice after the prayer he would do a ba'di because now he has added something that is a pillar to the prayer and so he would do a ba'di for it so after getting um, done saying if he recites the, if he if he repeats a surah or if he rec recites two surahs there's no prostration because that's not uh, he's not uh, adding an obligation but in the case of the Fatiha since it is an obligation if he recites it um, twice unwittingly, then he would do a ba'di. Whereas if it would done, if it was done intentionally, then it would be appear the prayer is invalid. So here, Imam Al Akhdari says, if a person does recites the Fatiha intentionally, his prayer is invalid. Previ uh, um, um, he just mentioned that if if a person recites it unwittingly, he does a ba'di. But if he does it intentionally, then it's as if he's now added intentionally added a pillar to the prayer, and he, and the prayer is invalid. The dominant opinion, though, is that in the case of uh, intentional recitation of the Fatiha, his prayer is valid. Other pillars of the prayer, if they're, if they're done intentionally, it would invalidate it. But in the case of the Fatiha, if it, was, if it was recited intentionally twice, it would not invalidate the prayer. Should one remember omitting the surah after he's begun to do ruku', then in that case, he should, he should not return to it. So if a person... For, uh, reads Fatiha and then he forgets to read the surah and now he goes into Ruku'ah. If he has now gone, gone into Ruku'ah and that's defined that his, the palms of his hands are now near his, uh, near his knees even if they have not touched the knees, he is now in a state of Ruku'ah uh, so he would not stand back up because by standing back up it's as if he's adding an, uh, an addition to the, uh, an obligation to the prayer and that obligation is um, rising from the ruku' is one of the obligations. So if he goes into the ruku' and then now comes back up and then goes goes in, it's going to be as if he's now added an, ob an obligation to the prayer. So he would not return to it. And then he would dress it at the end of the prayer by prostrating a qabli for missing that surah. Whereas if a person has not fully gone into his ruku' has just bent his back slightly and has put his hands down but the, the palms have not reached the, the, the knees or near the knees, then at that point he would go back, he would stand back up, and then complete the surah. وَمَنْ تَذَكَّرَ السِّرَّ أَوَ الْجَهْرَ قَبْلَ الرُّكُوعِ أَعَادَ الْقِرَاءَةَ فَإِنْ كَانَ ذَلِكَ فِي السُّورَةِ وَحْدَهَا أَعَادَهَا وَلَا سُجُودَ عَلَيْهِ وَإِنْ كَانَ فِي الْفَاتِحَةِ أَعَادَهَا وَسَجَدَ بَعْدَ السَّلَامِ وَإِنْ فَاتَ بِالرُّكُوعِ سَجَدَ لِتَرْكِ الْجَهْرِ قَبْلَ السَّلَامِ وَلِتَرْكِ السِّرِّ بَعْدَ السَّلَامِ سَوَاءٌ كَانَ مِنَ الْفَاتِحَةِ أَوَ السُّورَةِ وَحْدَهَا However, if he misses one of them due to ruku', then he should prostrate for praying silently in a vocal part before the salam and for reciting out loud in a silent prayer after the salam. This is true whether it was the Fatiha or the Surah alone. So he said that if he realized the mistake in the recitation before going into ruku', then he would address it. He would re repeat it silently uh, where appropriate and he would repeat it vocally where appropriate. But say he goes into ruku' now and he and uh, he's um um and he re and realized that he um, um recited it improperly then he would not go back to it and he would prostrate if he had recited it out loud where he should have been silently then he does a ba'di and if he recited silently where he should have been uh, um recited silently where it should have been out loud then he would do it um he would do a qabli because now subtracted so if in dhuhr prayer he recites the surah or the fatiha one of them or both of them, he recites them out loud, and he doesn't realize it until after going into the court, then he would continue his prayer and prostrate a ba'di after the salam because it's as if he's added something to the prayer. Or, for example, in the case of Maghrib, if he's recited silently in either the Fatiha or the Surah or both of them, and he does not realize that until after he's gone into the court, then he continues on his, in his prayer, and then he would prostrate before the salam a qabli because of the subtraction. ومن ضحك في الصلاة بطلت سواء كان ساهيا أو عامدا ولا يضحك في صلاته إلا غافل متلاعب والمؤمن إذا قام للصلاة أعرض بقلبه عن كل ما سوى الله سبحانه وترك الدنيا وما فيها حتى يحضر بقلبه جلال الله سبحانه وعظمته ويرتعد قلبه وترهب نفسه من هيبة الله جل جلاله فهذه صلاة المتقين ولا شيء عليه في التبسم Whoever laughs in prayer whether it was intentional or unintentional, has invalidated his prayer. So if a person um, lets out a sound um, of laughter in his prayer, even if it's just a little bit, whether it was intentional or unintentional, or he was overwhelmed, somebody um, uh, 
said something to him or did something or somebody, a child is um, uh, playing with his clothes and then he starts laughing or he sees his child do something and he laughs and he lets out, um, uh, he, lets, he makes a sound, then that would uh, uh, invalidate his prayer whether it was intentional or unintentional. And then Imam al he says, In fact, none laughs, nobody laughs in his prayer except a heedless fool. As for the believer, if he stands for prayer, his heart turns to be to him. Away from everything other than Allah, glory be to him. He abandons the world and what is in it to the degree that he is completely present with his heart before, his, before the majesty and magnification and exaltedness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. His heart flutters with awe and his soul is filled with awe-inspired reverence before the majestic position of his Lord exalted is his majesty. This is the prayer of those who have fearful awareness. As for a smile, there is nothing owed for it. So that description that he gave is the prayer of, a, uh, of, the, of the muttaqin. And we ask Allah to, uh, to make us from amongst them. And he's saying that if he mentioned this after mentioning the hukam about laughing in the prayer, so he's saying if a person realizes this and realizes the station of the prayer and is in the prayer, no matter what happens, he's not going to be affected. So he wouldn't laugh. So he's saying whether a person laughed intentionally or unintentionally or was overwhelmed, if he was in the state of uh, having the um, prayer of those who have fearful aware, awareness, the muttaqin, the, the pious, then he wouldn't, he wouldn't, nobody would be able to make him laugh or he wouldn't have the, uh, the, 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 the ability, the capability to laugh in his prayer. As for a smile, there's nothing owed for it. So he mentioned the laughing, which is, it has, there has to be a sound. Whereas if a person smiles in his prayer, somebody does something or says something or he thinks about something and he smiles, then there's nothing owed for that. وبكاء الخاشع في الصلاة مغتفر ومن أنصت لمتحدث قليلا فلا شيء عليه ومن قام من ركعتين قبل الجلوس فإن تذكر قبل أن يفارق الأرض بيديه وركبتيه رجع إلى الجلوس ولا ولا سجود عليه. The weeping of one in genuine humbleness is excused. There is nothing owed upon one who listens to someone talking for a moment. As for the one who rises before his pro- uh, from his prostration before he has actually sat, then should he remember it before both his knees or both his hands have left the ground, he should return to the sitting position and no prostration is owed. However, should he actually separate from the ground, then he should continue and not return to the sitting position and a prostration before the salam is owed. Should he return after his knees and hands have left the ground, even if he returns from the standing position, whether intentionally or not, then his prayer is valid and he should do a prostration after the salam. If a person is weeping in the prayer, even if there's sound associated with it, it's excused. So he mentioned that if a person laughs in prayer, a sound is, um, is, is, is made by the person in laughter, then then his prayer is invalid. Whereas if a person is weeping, and it's, gen- it's, it's weeping done out of genuine, genuine humbleness, and it's buka, it's done with a sound, a person makes uh, sounds while they're weeping in the prayer, then that's not, uh, that does not harm the prayer. Whereas if it's not done out of genuine humbleness, he's thinking about a relative that died, or something that he didn't get, and he starts to cry, and a, a sound is made, then uh, his prayer is invalid. So if it's only specifically talking about weeping, if a sound is made and it's done out of genuine humbleness. And of course, if it's done out of genuine humbleness and there's no sound, there's only tears, then of course this is um, uh, also excused. There's nothing owed upon one who listens to someone talking for a moment. So if a person's in their prayer and somebody's mentioning something around them, they're saying, oh, you know, so-and-so, he got better, he was sick, and so, or so-and-so who was traveling, he got back home and everything's fine, and, or he's talking about some important news or something, whatever it may be, and he listens in to that, uh, to that for a minute, then there was, uh, there's no harm in that. As for the one who rises from his prostration before he has actually sat, then should he remember it before both his knees or his uh, hands have left the ground, he should return to the sitting position and no prostration is owed. So this is now this next um, um, uh, paragraph is talking about a person that forgets to do the middle sitting. So if a person, the first tashahud, after coming up from the prostration, he should sit down after two rak'ahs of maghrib or dhuhr or, uh, um, or, um, or, or isha or asr, he should sit down and do the middle prostrate, uh, the middle sitting, the tashahud. But say he forgets to do that, and from the from the prostration he begins to stand up. He's saying if 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 his hands and his knees have not left the ground, 
then he should just sit back down and complete his tashahud and there's nothing owed upon him. So he wouldn't have to say, well, I kind of, I almost stood up and now I sat down, so I've added something to the prayer. He's saying, no, that's not considered an addition, um, uh, an addition that would require a, uh, a ba'di, an, uh, a prostration after the salam. So if either one of his hands are on the ground or one of his knees, one of those four things, the two hands or the two knees, as long as one of them is still on the ground, then he sits back down and there's nothing owed. However, should he actually separate from the ground, then he should continue and not return to the sitting position, and a prostration before, before the salam is owed. So now, if, if both his hands and both his knees have left the ground, he should not return back to the sitting position, and then he stands up and completes his prayer, and then he would prostrate a qabli, a pre-salam prostration, because, because he has left that tashahud, which is a sunnah. So by leaving that sunnah, he owes a, he owes a qabli. Should he uh, return after his knees and hands have left the ground, even if he returns from the standing position, whether intentionally or not, then his prayer is valid and he should do a prostration after the salam. So if he leaves, the, the, uh, both his hands and both his knees have left the ground, and now he's on his way to the standing position, or he's actually in the standing position now, and he realizes that he has not done the sitting, the tashahud, and he sits back down, then his prayer is valid, even though he's now, it's as if he has added a standing, um, his prayer is valid, but he would do a prostration after the salam. He should not do that. He should not sit back down. But if he does it, the prayer, the prayer is valid. So there's there's three situations. There's one where the knees, both knees, or both uh, uh, both knees and both hands, or even one of those four things are still touching the ground. Then in that case, he would sit back down, do the tashahud, continue his prayer, and there's nothing owed, no prostration. If both his knees and both his hands have left the ground, then he continues standing, uh, completes his prayer, and then he would do a qabli because of missing the tashahud, which is a sunnah. If he has stood up or left the ground with both his hands and both his knees and gone back to the sitting position, his prayer is correct, but he would owe a ba'di, a post-salam prostration, because of addition. وَمَنْ نَفَخَ فِي صَلَاتِهِ سَاهِيًا سَجَدَ بَعْدَ السَّلَامِ وَإِنْ كَانَ عَامِدًا بَطَلَتْ صَلَاتُهُمْ Whoever blows air in his prayer unwittingly, he should do a post-salam prostration, a prostration after the salam. If it was intentional, his prayer is invalid. So if a person blows air, he, um, he, makes a, he, he blows air with, uh, with, his, with his mouth, then his, if it's done unwittingly, then he would do a ba'di. If it was done intentionally, then his prayer is invalid because it's as if he spoke in the prayer. Making a sound with the mouth, it's as if, it's as if he's speaking. So even though it's just, he's just breathing, um, it's just kind of like, um, um, like a, a, a person breathes, uh, breathes out, uh, out of his mouth uh, hev- heavily, not something, not normal breathing, then that would invalidate his prayer if it was done intentionally. And if it was done unintentionally, he would do a ba'di. Where if it's, as if it's breathing, he breathed heavily out of his nose, then um, that would that would not harm the prayer. وَمَنْ عَطَسَ فِي صَلَاتِهِ فَلَا يَشْتَغِلُ بِالْحَمْدِ وَلَا يَرُدُّ عَلَى مَنْ شَمَّتَهُ وَلَا يُشَمِّتُ عَاطِسًا فَإِنْ حَمِدَ اللَّهَ فَلَا شَيْءَ عَلَيْهِ وَمَنْ تَثَاءَبَ فِي الصَّلَاتِ سَدَّفَاهُ وَلَا يَنْفُثُ إِلَّا فِي ثَوْبِهِ مِنْ غَيْرِ إِخْرَاجِ حُرُوفٍ if one sneezes during his prayer, he should not engage himself in praise, nor should he respond to someone who blesses him. Nor should he bless someone who sneezes. However, if he does praise Allah, there is nothing owing upon him. Whoever yawns in his prayer should cover his mouth. Or should he spit, then only in his clothes, without reciting any words while doing either. So, if one sneezes during his prayer, then he should not engage in himself in praise. Normally, if a person sneezes, it's recommended for him to say, Alhamdulillah. And then, if a person hears him, the person that hears him, it's wajib for them to say, Yarhamakullah. And then it's recommended for him to respond by saying, يَغْفِرُ اللَّهُ لَنَا وَلَكُمْ But if he's in the prayer and he sneezes, then he should not, a person should not say, Alhamdulillah. He should leave that. And nor should he respond to someone who blesses him. So if he, if he does say, Alhamdulillah, and somebody, um, somebody uh, around him says, Yarhamakullah, he should not respond to that. Nor should he bless someone who sneezes. Nor should he, he's in the prayer and somebody around him sneezes and says Alhamdulillah and then he in the prayer says Yarhamakullah. However, if he does praise Allah, then there's nothing owing upon him. So there's three situations. Either he, he's, uh, the person praying says Alhamdulillah, 
the person praying uh, responds to somebody else who says Alhamdulillah. So he said, Yarhamukallah. Or he's, he, he's, he said, uh, the, pr- the person praying said, Alhamdulillah. Somebody else said, Yarhamukallah. And then he responded by saying, Yarhamukallah. So in the first situation, if a person sneezes and says, Alhamdulillah, his prayer is correct. He says, if he pr- does praise Allah, there's nothing owing upon him. It's, re- it's recommended for him to leave it in that situation. But if he does it, there's nothing owing upon him. Whereas if he sneezes, and then somebody says, Yarhamukallah. And then he's in the prayer, and he responds to that person by saying, Yarhamukallah. His prayer is invalid because it's as if he spoke, he's addressed that person. Or he's in the prayer, he hears somebody outside of his prayer saying, uh, sneezing and saying Alhamdulillah, and then he says, Yarhamukullah. It's as if he's addressed him now, so it's as if he spoke to him, and, and, um, and that, would be, uh, that would invalidate his prayer. Because it's as if he, he intentionally spoke to him. Whoever yawns in prayer should cover his mouth. If a person uh, yawns in prayer or outside of prayer also for that matter, he w- it's recommended that he covers his mouth either with the bottom or the back of the right hand or the back of the left hand. Whereas the bottom of the left hand should not be used to, um, to cover the mouth when yawning because it, the, the, bo- the, 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 the bottom of the left hand is using for cleaning najasa and so it would not be used uh, put, uh, near the mouth. Should he spit then only in his clothes or cloth without reciting any words while doing other. So if a person needs to clear his throat or get something out of his mouth, um, get the spittle out of his mouth, then he would do so only in his either his, uh, his clothes or a piece of cloth or in his hands and then, and then, and then wipe it uh, on, on a piece of cloth or something. But he would do it without reciting any words. So when a person, usually when they spit, if they just spit normally, there's, uh, there's letters produced. If a person says tu, there's a ta and there's a fa. So that would uh, invalidate the prayer if it was done intentionally. If it was done unintentionally, he would do a ba'di. So if a person needs to spit in the prayer, they would merely take uh, their, their, a napkin, a tissue, and put it near the mouth and just wipe, oh, um, just spit, uh, spit lightly into the, uh, into the napkin, but just um, let it, getting the spit out of the mouth without blowing it out, without spitting it out. وَمَنْ شَكَّ فِي حَدَثٍ أَوْ نَجَاسَةٍ فَتَفَكَّرَ فِي صَلَاتِهِ قَلِيلًا ثُمَّ تَيَقَّنَ الطَّهَارَةَ فَلَا شَيْءَ عَلَيْهِ Whoever has doubts concerning impurities, najasa, and ponders this for a moment in his prayer, and then becomes assured of his purity, then nothing is binding, uh, has nothing binding upon him. So if a person is in the prayer, and now he, has, he thinks for a while, he, he has doubts. Do I have najasa on my clothes or not? Did I clean that off? Or he thinks, did I do, did I do wudu or not? He does that for a moment and then he becomes assured of his purity. There's nothing binding him upon him for that. So in that case, he wouldn't say, well, uh, during that instance of thinking that I had najas on my prayer, that my prayer became invalid, or I thought, you know, for a few instances or for, or for um, a minute that I did not have wudu, so my prayer is invalid. He's saying, no, if he becomes assured of his purity, then nothing is binding upon him. وَمَنْ الْتَفَتَ فِي الصَّلَاةِ سَاهِيًا فَلَا شَيْءَ عَلَيْهِ وَإِنْ تَعَمَّدَ فَهُوَ مَكْرُوهٌ وَإِنْ اسْتَدْبَرَ الْقِبْلَةَ قَطَعَ الصَّلَاةِ Whoever glances around unwittingly has nothing binding upon him, whereas if he does that wittingly, then it is reprehensible only, it's disliked. If it is done to the extent of turning his back on the qibla, then he has broken his prayer. So if a person looks around in the prayer, um, he has nothing binding upon him. Turning his face away from the qibla um, and looking around, there's nothing uh, upon him for that. Whether it was done, um, um, if it, this was, if it was done with a purpose, or if it was done unwittingly. Where if it was done intentionally, and there's no purpose, then it is considered disliked. So to look around in the prayer is considered disliked unless there's a purpose. So if a person wants to, he's looking to see his his, his belongings don't get stolen. He's checking them. He goes back to his prayer. Or he's making sure that his children aren't in um, in um, doing something that might harm them. And then he goes back to his prayer. Then there's no harm in that. And there he has not done something makru. But if there's no purpose to looking around, then it's considered makru. If it is done to the extent of turning his back on the qibla, then his prayer is broken. So if he turns around until now his um, he has turned his back or his shoulder um, to, the, to the qibla, then he has broken his pr- prayer. And this is one of the worst ways that a person can, can break his prayer by turning his back on the qibla. وَمَنْ صَلَّى بِحَرِيرٍ أَوْ بِذَهِبٍ أَوْ سَرَقَ فِي الصَّلَاةِ أَوْ نَظَرَ مُحَرَّمًا فَهُوَ عَاصٍ وَصَلَاتُهُ صَحِيحَةٌ Whoever prays in silk or gold or steals while praying or looks upon the prohibited, 
then he is rebellious, but the prayer is outwardly valid. So if a person, for a man, if he prays in silk, if he wears silk or he prays upon a silk carpet, or he wears gold, or he steals while praying, or he looks upon the prohibited, he looks at something haram, he looks at a woman while he's praying, then he is rebellious, he has done something haram, but the prayer is valid. So here he's, he's, um, uh, he's um, mentioning uh, an important thing to remember in this section and in other sections, which is to differentiate between something that may be pro between prohibition and between validity. So something may be prohibited to do, but that action remains valid. So for example, it's prohibited for a man to wear silk or gold. And in the prayer, it's even more prohibited. But if he does that, he has now done something haram, but his prayer is valid. Or if he steals, or if he looks upon the haram. By doing that thing, he has done something haram, but his prayer is still, con is still considered valid. And there's other situations too, like in fasting, if a person, he may, he may lie, or he may backbite, or he may look at the haram things, and he may s s cheat or steal. He's doing haram things within Ramadan, but his prayer, his, his fast is still valid. But a person should also remember that within the, the the sanctuaries of Allah, whether it's time or place, the prohibited matters actually become worse. And there's more a punishment associated with doing a prohibited act within those times or places, within the sacred times or places. So during Ramadan, uh, doing an act of um, a wrong action is worse than outside of Ramadan. Doing it while in Mecca or Medina is worse than doing it in other places. Doing a wrong action while in prayer is worse than doing it outside of prayer. Um, even though in, in, uh, in all situations a person would leave wrong actions, but when they're in sacred uh, times or sacred places, then uh, the, 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 the punishment becomes um, uh, worse, just as the reward for doing good actions in those times and in those places because it becomes increased. وَمَنْ غَلِطَ فِي الْقِرَاءَةِ بِكَلِمَةٍ مِنْ غَيْرِ الْقُرْآنِ سَجَدَ بَعْدَ السَّلَامِ وَإِنْ كَانَتْ مِنَ الْقُرْآنِ فَلَا سُجُودَ عَلَيْهِ إِلَّا أَنْ يَتَغَيَّرَ اللَّفْظُ أَوْ يَفْسُدَ الْمَعْنَى فَيَسْجُدُ بَعْدَ السَّلَامِ Whoever makes a mistake in a word that is not from the Qur'an owes a prostration after the salam. It is, if it is from the Qur'an, then he, is, he, then he owes nothing as long as he has not changed its wor wording or corrupted its meaning. In that case, he should prostrate after the salam. Whoever, mistakes, whoever makes a mistake in a word that is not from the Qur'an owes a prostration after the salam. So if a person is reciting in the Qur'an and then during his recitation of the Fatiha or during his recitation of the Surah, he, he, he accidentally says a word that's totally not from the Qur'an. He's reciting Fatiha and in the middle of Fatiha he begins reciting the Tashahud. Or he says something that's not even, he just starts, um, he accidentally says something else in the, um, uh, another Arabic word within that recitation. He would, he would have to do a prostration after the Salam, a Ba'di for that. If it is from the Qur'an, then he owes nothing as long as, his, as long as he has not changed its wording or corrupted its meaning. In that case, he should prostrate from after the salam. So if he's in the midst of, of reciting Qur'an, and he brings in a word um, and puts it in, in its improper place, but that word is from the Qur'an, then there is nothing owed upon him. So if he's reading Fatiha and accidentally he recites uh, a portion of, of Qul Huwa Allahu Ahd, he recites a portion of Ikhlas, then that would not, um, he would not owe anything for that. So if he brought in a, a, foreign, a word foreign to the Qur'an and, and, and recited it during the recitation of the Qur'an, then he would prostrate a ba'di. If he brought a, a word from the Qur'an and put it in, uh, in another place of the Qur'an, then he would owe nothing. Unless he changed the wording or corrupted its meaning. So if he changed the wording of the Qur'an, he, he's reciting the, the Qur'an and he and makes a mistake in the wording. Instead of a kha, he says a ha. Instead of a, a ta, he says a tha. Instead of a sad, he says a seen. He, he makes a mistake in the wording or in the grammar of the Qur'an. So instead of, uh, if, it's a, if it's a ta with a fatha, he says it with a dhamma. And, and that changes the meaning. Then he would prostrate after the salam. Or he corrupted the meaning. He corrupted the meaning by changing the, gra the grammar of the word, like in, uh, in, in the Fatiha. We says, اِهْدِنَا الصِّرَاطَ الْمُسْتَقِيمِ صِرَاطَ الَّذِينَ أَنْعَمْتَ عَلَيْهِمْ Here we're speaking to Allah, we're saying, أَنْعَمْتَ عَلَيْهِمْ So there's a Fatiha on the Ta, because that's the, the Ta that we're using when you speak to somebody. If he changes the, the, the Fatiha on the Ta to a Dhamma, 
and now says the ta with adlamma, he's now changed the meaning to say, instead of saying, guide us to the straight path, اهدنا الصراط المستقيم, صراط الذين أنعمت عليهم, the straight, guide us to the straight path, the, the, the path that you favored upon those, if he says أنعمت عليهم, that's that you speaking to Allah. If he changes the ta, uh, the fatha and the ta to adlamma, now he's talking about himself. If he says that, now it, it changes the meaning to say the the path that I have favored upon them. So now he has changed just a, he's changed um, a fatha to a dhamma, but he has now changed the meaning of the word. So if he does that, he would go back and correct it, and then he would do a ba'di uh, after the salam, or he corrupted its meaning. He didn't change the 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 the. The, the word of the, he didn't change anything in the word but and he kept the word intact but now he brought it out of its place and now it changes the meaning of the Quran for example if he's talking if he's reciting in an ayah where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is um, talking about the people that do good actions and for them is Jannah and so instead of Jannah he says fire he says for the people that do good actions for them is hellfire now the word nar was from the Quran and he did not um, corrupt the, the, the way it was uh, said but now he's put it in a place that changes the meaning of that ayah so in that case he would, um, he would prostrate after the salam وَمَنْ نَعَسَ فِي الصَّلَاةِ فَلَا سُجُودَ عَلَيْهِ وَإِنْ ثَقُلَ نَوْمُهُ أَعَادَ الصَّلَاةَ وَالْوُضُوءَ وَأَنِينُ الْمَرِيضِ مُغْتَفَرٌ وَالتَّنَحْنُحُ لِلْضَرُورَةِ مُغْتَفَرٌ وَلِلْإِفْهَامِ مُنْكَرٌ وَلَا تَبْطُلُ الصَّلَاةُ بِهِ Whoever dozes off in prayer, there is nothing binding upon him. If the sleep is heavy, he must repeat the prayer and his wudu. The groans of a sick person are forgiven. Coughing out of necessity is forgiven. But if it is done for communication, it is disliked and the prayer is not invalidated by it. So he says if a person dozes off in prayer, just kind of lightly nods off in his prayer, there's nothing binding upon him as long as the, he the sleep is not heavy. If the sleep is heavy, and the heavy sleep and the light sleep was discussed in the section on the things that break wudu, if the sleep was heavy, he must repeat the prayer and of course his wudu because also his wudu is broken. The groans of a sick person are forgiven. If a person is sick and out of the pains of his sickness, he's making sounds, then those things are forgiven. Coughing out of necessity is forgiven. If a person has to cough out of necessity, then it's, an, it's forgiven. But if it's done for communication, if you want to try to have somebody understand something, somebody's trying to come into the door and you cough to, tell, to try to communicate with him, meaning come in the door or if he's looking for something or if he's looking for you and you cough to try to let him know that you're in prayer, to do the coughing for communication is makru, is disliked. But if it's done, the prayer is still valid. وَمَنْ نَادَاهُ أَحَدٌ فَقَالَ لَهُ سُبْحَانَ اللَّهِ كُرِهَ وَصَحَتْ صَلَاتُهُ If someone calls someone praying and he replies, SubhanAllah, then this is reprehensible, but the prayer is sound. So Imam al-Akhdari here is saying that if a person is in the prayer and he wants to get a message to somebody, somebody calls him and he wants to make it clear to him that he's in prayer, or he's trying to show him, point to him something, and he's trying to get his attention, and so he says, SubhanAllah, SubhanAllah in the prayer. He said, this is reprehensible, but the prayer is sound. The dominant opinion... <coughs> is that it is not reprehensible for him to do that because of the hadith where the Prophet ﷺ said that if you're in the prayer and you, and you need to um, have something, get a message across, then you, say, then you say subhanallah. So he would do that um, if somebody's talking to him and he wants to tell him that he's in the prayer or if he wants to get somebody's attention, he would say subhanallah, subhanallah, and it would not be makru and his prayer of course would be valid. ومن وقف في القراءة ولم يفتح عليه أحد ترك تلك الآية وقرأ ما بعدها فإن تعذرت عليه ركعة ولا ينظر مصحفا بين يديه إلا يكون في الفاتحة فلا بد من كمالها بمصحف أو غيره فإن ترك منها آية سجد قبل السلام وإن كان أكثر بطل صلاتهم Whoever hesitates in his recitation and no one interjects, then he should leave that particular verse and recite the following verse. Should he be unable to do that, then he should simply go into ruku' and he should not look to a copy of the Qur'an in his presence unless it is for the Fatiha, which is mandatory to complete through a copy of the Qur'an or some other means. Should he omit one verse from the Fatiha, then he needs to prostrate before the Salam. If more than a verse is omitted, then the prayer is invalid. So he says, if whoever hesitates in his recitation and no one interjects, then he should leave that particular verse and recite the following verse. So if a person's praying and he's the imam, 
or he's praying and there's somebody next to him and he's reciting and in the midst of the surah he, he draws a blank and he doesn't know what's next and nobody uh, interjects and helps him along then he would leave that particular verse and then recite the following verse should he be unable to do that then he should simply go into ruku'ah so if he's in the he's reciting and then uh, he's in the surah and he can't remember what's next nobody interjects or there's nobody to interject he should go to the ayah that's after it if he can't even remember what the ayah that's after it then he just goes into ruku'ah because he has completed the recita- the, the sunnah of the surah by reciting even one um, uh, ayah and then he would go into ruku'ah and he should not look to a copy of the quran in his presence unless it is for, unless it is for fa- fatiha which is mandatory to complete through a copy of the Qur'an or some other means. So if he's in the midst of a recitation and he draws a blank about the, the surah that he's reciting, he should not uh, take out the mushaf that's in his pocket or near him in his presence, he grabs a mushaf from the table and opens it to complete the surah. It's, uh, um, uh, it would be considered makruh for him to do that, disliked. Unless it was the fatiha. Unless he, he, um, he, needed, um, he forgot an ayah from the fatiha, uh, he would have to take a mushaf for uh, and, and 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 read from the mushaf to complete his uh, to complete the fatiha because it's ma- because it is mandatory for a person to complete the the, the fatiha in the, in the prayer. So if a person has not memorized fatiha or he has memorized it but now he's uh, he forgot something, then in his case he would have to have it written on a piece of paper that he takes out to read, or he takes a uh, he has a he has a book with it written on it and he and he reads it. Um, because it's mandatory to complete it through recitation, uh, reciting it from a copy of the Quran or some other means. If a person doesn't have the ability to recite the Fatiha because he's a new Muslim and he hasn't memorized the Fatiha yet, then he has to complete it either by looking at a piece of paper or some other means, such as having uh, praying behind an imam that has memorized the Fatiha. So when a person becomes Muslim, until he memorizes the Fatiha, what he should be doing is find somebody uh, and pray behind him. Because the person praying behind the imam, it's not an obligation for him to recite the fatiha. So he would pray behind him until he memorizes the fatiha. Or he would have it on a piece of paper and he can read it from the piece of paper until he memorizes it. Should he omit one verse from it, meaning from the fatiha, then he needs to prostrate before the salam. So he's saying here that if a person is in the midst of recitation of the fatiha and forgets to recite one of the, the ayahs, forgettingly, then he would prostrate before the salam, he would do a qabli. If more than one verse is omitted, then his prayer is invalid. This is the opinion that Imam al-Akhdari is mentioning here. The dominant opinion though, is that whether he misses one verse or more than one verse, he would prostrate a qabli for that. But he would, he would continue his prayer, prostrate the qabli, and then, repeat, and then after he says salam, repeat that prayer again. Um, and the reason he would do that is because the dominant opinion is that you have to recite the entire Fatiha in all the rak'ahs of the prayer. So by missing even one, uh, one ayah or a portion of, a, uh, of, of the Fatiha, he has not completed that obligation. But there is an opinion that um, he can, he can, if it's one ayah, he can prostrate the qabli. So because there is that opinion that, um, that he can prostrate the qabli, he completes this prayer on that opinion. And then once he's done, he um, to 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 be following the dominant opinion, the stronger opinion, he completes the, he 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 repeats the pr- prayer totally. وَمَنْ فَتَحَ عَلَى غَيْرِ إِمَامِهِ بَطَرَتْ صَلَاتُهُ وَلَا يَفْتَحُ عَلَى إِمَامِهِ إِلَّا يَنْتَظِرَ الْفَتْحَ أَوْ يُفْسِدُ الْمَعْنَى Whoever corrects while praying a reciter other than his imam has invalidated his prayer. Moreover, one should not interrupt his imam unless he waits for someone to do so, or he corrupts the meaning of a verse. If a person is praying and there's somebody uh, praying next to him in another prayer, or somebody reciting Qur'an, and, he, um, and the person reciting the Qur'an makes a mistake, and the person praying now corrects him. That would invalidate his prayer because it's as if he's addressing him. If it was his uh, imam, then that's uh, permissible under certain conditions, and it would not harm his prayer. But if, he re- if a person praying recites the recitation of somebody other than his imam, whether it's another prayer or just a person pr- uh, reciting Qur'an, it would invalidate his prayer. Moreover, one should not interrupt his imam unless he waits for someone to do so or he corrupts the meaning of a verse. And so if a person is praying behind the imam and the imam um, uh, pauses because he doesn't know what's next on the ayah, he forgets he's trying to remember, or he corrupts the meaning of a verse, 
then somebody behind him should correct him or remind him, should interject, but he should only do so after the imam signals to somebody by saying subhanallah or he signals with his hand that he needs um, someone to interject or he waits a long time or he makes a mistake in the verse. So at that case, the person then would interject, correct the corrupt meaning immediately or interject and remind him after, uh, after, a, uh, after a, a pause or after uh, being signaled to. So what he's saying is that a person should not immediately jump to correcting his imam. If he's praying behind the imam and he pauses for a second, he shouldn't just be waiting just to, to correct the imam and jump. He should give the imam um, a, f a few moments to, to, to remember and then he would correct. But if he had corrupted the, the meaning and, he, and he's going on and he's not going back to, uh, to fix the meaning, he would immediately fix it. ومن جعل فكره قليلا في أمور الدنيا نقص ثوابه ولم تبطل صلاته. Whoever's mind wanders into worldly matters during the prayer, his reward diminishes, but his prayer is not invalidated. So if a person during the prayer thinks about matters of the dunya, or even thinks about matters of, say, fiqh, he's thinking about um, his studies, his deen studies, in the prayer, that would be makru. It would be it would be disliked, but it does not invalidate his prayer. So a person in his prayer should be thinking just on um, on uh, on the Yom Al Qiyamah, on the matters of the of the grave, on the matters of the afterlife, things things that would give him more humble uh, submission to the prayer. He should not be thinking about matters of the dunya. وَمَنْ دَفَعَ الْمَاشِي بَيْنَ يَدَيْهِ أَوْ سَجَدَ عَلَى شَقِّ جَبْهَتِهِ أَوْ سَجَدَ عَلَى طَيَّةٍ أَوْ طَيَّتَيْنِ مِنْ عِمَامَتِهِ فَلَا شَيْءَ عَلَيْهِ وَلَا شَيْءَ فِي غَلَبَةِ الْقَيْءِ وَالْقَلَسِ فِي الصَّلَاةِ Whoever prevents someone from walking in front of him or prostrates on a part of his forehead or one or two of his turbans fold owes nothing. There's no harm in being overwhelmed by vomit or qalas during the prayer. So if a person walks in front of the, 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 the prayer and you stop him, that, uh, that uh, you do not owe anything for doing that. A person wouldn't say, well, I've now done this extra action, it's an addition, I have to do a ba'di. He's saying, no, that's, uh, that's uh, not an addition that would require a ba'di. And the person walking in front of you, it doesn't mean um, very much in front of you, it just means in the area that you're going to be prostrating and bowing in, that area around you, about three feet from you, just the area that you need to prostrate and bow in. That's the area that is haram for a person to walk in front of. If somebody walks in front of you, then you just stick your hand out uh, lightly and um, to, to push them away. If they keep coming, you, you become stern, but you don't get too much you know, to, you, uh, to, to hit the person or to, to start fighting with them because at that point, um, you're now doing too much actions and it would invalidate your prayer. So if the person is being stubborn and refusing, then you just uh, stop and then they walk in front of you. It's a sin upon them for doing that. Uh, and you just, but you complete, complete your prayer. If a person gets into an altercation because of that, now he's invalidated his prayer because he's done too much actions. Or prostrates on a part of his forehead. Or one or two of, of his uh, turbans fold owes nothing. So in the section of the, of the, the obligations of the prayer, it says um, one of the obligations is prostrating on a portion of the forehead. On, on his forehead. Now say a person just goes and prostrates on the side, on the right side of his forehead or on the left side. He's saying that a person owes nothing. The optimum thing is to have your head uh, flat on the ground with as much of the forehead as you can from the middle part and then going um, to, the, to the sides um, on the ground. But if a person turns his head slightly to the right or to the left and has a, um, a, a, a one of the sides of his forehead on the ground, that's fine as long as he has a portion of the forehead on the ground. Or one or two of his turbans fold. If a person prostrates on one or two of his turbans folds, then he owes nothing. Or if he has a cap and between the ground and his forehead is a cap, then he owes nothing. So as long as the barrier between his forehead and the ground or the thing that he's prostrating on is, is thin, one or two thin folds of a turban or a small cap, then he owes nothing. If it's too thick, if it's thicker than two folds or if it's a thick cap, like a, like a thick... Um, uh, a thick beanie or something. If he prostrates on that, then now it's as if there's a barrier between him and the ground, and so that prostration is not correct. There's no harm in being overwhelmed by vomit or qalas during the prayer. So if a person during the prayer, he vomits, or he experiences qalas, qalas is um, uh, a sour um, um, type fluid that's in the stomach, um, which is sometimes called um, reflux. 
If that comes out during the person, sometimes a person may uh, burp and g uh, get a little bit of that, uh, of that um, bitter uh, fluid in the mouth, then that would not invalidate the prayer. But the conditions of the vomit not invalidating the prayer are three. One, that it was not intentional. If he intentionally caused himself to vomit, then his prayer is invalid. Also, that when this vomit came out, he did not swallow any of it. So he just he spits it out into a napkin or puts it into um, 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 spits it on the side, but spits without making a sound, as was previously mentioned. And also that the vomit is pure. And the way it's uh, known that it is pure is that it has not changed. If the vomit, uh, if a person ate some food and then regurgitated it shortly thereafter, and it is not changed, then it's considered pure. As soon as it changes in the way it's smelling or the way, uh, the way it tastes, then that's now considered najas, it's considered impure. So as soon as it gets into the mouth, then the person's prayer is invalid. So if he, um, also that the, um, that the, the vomit is, is a small amount. So it has to be a small amount. None is, um, is re-ingested. Uh, uh, it has to be spit out. And also that it's pure. So it's pure, a small amount, and it's spit out. If he swallows it, if, he, if it's impure, meaning that it's changed, or if it's a large amount, it's filled up his mouth, then he, uh, the, the prayer is invalid. Now, if the vomit has not come all the way up to the mouth, it just the person feels it kind of in his throat, and then automatically he gets a reflex and he swallows it down, that's not considered re, um, uh, ingesting the, the, the vomit again, because it has to get to a point where he can spit it out. If it gets to a point where he has the ability to spit it out, and then he swallows it again, that invalidates his prayer. But if it doesn't get to that point, it's still kind of in his throat, and then automatically a reflex comes and he swallows it, then there's nothing upon him for that. وسهو المأموم يحمله الإمام إلا أن يكون من نقص الفريضة وإن سهى المأموم أو نعس أو زوحم عن الركوع وهو في غير الأولى فإن طمع في إدراك الإمام قبل رفعه من السجدة الثانية ركع ولحقه وإن لم يطمع ترك الركوع وتبع إمامه وقضى ركعة في موضعها بعد السلام if a follower, the, that which the one being led is borne by the imam as long as it is not a missed obligation. So as long as a person is praying behind an imam, any mistakes he makes, any additions or subtractions uh, to the prayer, are uh, he does not have to address them because that's carried by his imam. And then also his imam too would not have to um, address him. So if a person's in the prayer and he adds an ac accidentally, uh, he, he does three prostrations instead of two, because he's praying behind the imam, the imam carries that for him. Unless it is missed obligation. Unless he prostrates one prostration instead of two. Or he doesn't do rukur. He can't say, well, my uh, mistakes are, are borne by the imam, are carried by the imam, so I don't have to do anything. If it's a missed obligation, then he has to address that. The only other situation where, um, um, also, also in the situation of missing the fatiha, he, he, um, uh, even though the Fatiha is normally an obligation, for the one following the Imam, it's a not, it is not an obligation for him to recite the Fatiha. So if a person's uh, behind the Imam and he forgets to recite the Fatiha or he just doesn't recite the Fatiha, um, there's nothing uh, upon him because the recitation of the, of the Fatiha for the follower is not an obligation. If a follower forgets, slumbers, or is unable to bow due to being crowded by others in other than the first Rak'ah, and believes that he can catch up with the imam before he comes out of the second prostration, then he should perform his bowing and then join him. If he does not think he can do that, then he should abandon the bowing and simply go to the imam's current position and redress the rak'ah that he missed after the imam finishes the final salam. So in this situation, before going into it line by line, um, a person would just have to understand the, the situation. A person, when he comes late to a prayer... He's um, uh, he has his first rak'ah, and it may or may not be the imam's first rak'ah. So if you if you catch the entire prayer with the imam, your first rak'ah, to be able to say that you've caught this rak'ah with the imam, you have to b get into rukur before he ca he starts coming out of it. So if a person comes late to the prayer, if it's his first rak'ah, if it's the if it's the latecomer's first rak'ah, whether or not it's the imam's first rak'ah, for him to to catch this rak'ah, he has to have his 
palms near the knees. He has to be in ruku' before the imam starts coming up. So f say for example, if a person comes late to dhuhr prayer, and the imam's in the third rak'ah. This is the imam's third rak'ah, but it's the follower's first rak'ah. So in that, he has to be in ruku' before the imam begins um, coming out of ruku'. So if he misses that, then he's, misses, he's missed that rak'ah. In other than that first rak'ah, for the, for, the, for, the, for, the, for, the, for the person that caught the entire prayer, after that first rak'ah, he can still catch that uh, rak'ah with the imam, even if he doesn't get into ruku' before the imam starts coming up. Or if the person, say for example, the latecomer, he comes on the third rak'ah, of the Imam's Dhuhr prayer. So this is the latecomer's first rak'ah. He has to be in ruku' before the Imam starts rising from the ruku' to consider himself, uh, have, uh, to, to consider that he has got this rak'ah. Now once he goes to his own second rak'ah, regardless of which position the Imam is in, once it's his second rak'ah with the Imam, for him to catch this rak'ah, um, he can even catch it even if the Imam has come out of bowing and he has not yet gone into bowing. So that's why he says, if a follower forgets, slumbers, or is unable to bow due to being crowded by others in other than the first rak'ah, meaning in other than the follower's first rak'ah, and believes he can catch up with the imam before he comes out of the second prostration, then he should perform the bowing and then join him. So if you're in other than your first rak'ah with the imam, and for whatever reason you, you don't catch the ruku' with the imam, you forget a person's thinking about something else and then realize, oh, the imam's in ruku' or he slumbers, or he's crowded out of that uh, of the ruku' but he believes that he can catch up to the imam before he comes out of the second prostration, then he should perform his bowing and then join him. So if a person, say he's standing, and he's thinking about something else, and then he looks at the imam, and he looks at the rest of the people praying, and he realizes now that the, he's come out of the, he's gone into ruku', come out of ruku', and now he's going to the prostration. If he thinks, this follow, if this follower that missed that ruku' with the imam, thinks that he can do his ruku' come out of it and catch up to the imam before the imam comes out of his second prostration then he would do all those things and then catch up to him if he does not think he can do that then he should abandon the bowing and simply go to the imam's current position and redress that rak'ah after the imam says the salam so if he knows that now it's too late um, uh, he knows that if he tries to do the ruku' and come out, he's not going to catch up to the imam before the imam comes out of the second sajda. So then he stops, um, uh, he does not try to do that, and then he goes to uh, wherever the imam is and, and completes the prayer with the imam. But once the imam says, Assalamu alaikum, he stands up and performs another rak'ah to replace that rak'ah. وَإِنْ سَهَا عَنِ السُّجُودِ أَوْ زُوحِمَ أَوْ نَعَسَ حَتَّى قَامَ الْإِمَامِ إِلَىٰ رَكْعَةٍ أُخْرَىٰ سَجَدَ إِنْ طَمَعَ فِي إِدْرَاكِ الْإِمَامِ قَبْلَ عَقْدِ الرُّكُوعِ وَإِلَّا تَرَكَهُ وَتَبِعَ الْإِمَامَ وَقَضَىٰ رَكْعَةً أُخْرَىٰ أَيْضًا وَحَيْثُ قَضَىٰ الرَّكْعَةَ فَلَا سُجُودَ عَلَيْهِ إِلَّا أَن يَكُونَ شَاكًا فِي الرُّكُوعِ أَوِ السُّجُودِ Likewise, should he forget, doze off, or be crowded out of performing a prostration, and the imam has already stood up for another rak'ah, yet he feels he can perform the prostration before the imam bows, then he should prostrate. If he does not think that that is possible, he should leave it and follow the imam and make up the missed rak'ah after the salam of the imam. In the case of making up a rak'ah, there is no prostration of forgetfulness owed, unless there is doubt about his bowing or prostration. So in the previous paragraph, he was talking about a person that is not able, that does not catch the ruku' with the imam, and now wants to do the ruku' and then catch up to where he is. So if it's the if he if it's not the ruku' that he missed, rather it's the prostration. It also has a specific hukums. So if he forgets, dozes off, or is crowded out of performing a prostration, he's thinking about something else, and then he realizes the imam has now performed the prostration, has now gone on to the next aspect of the prayer. Or he dozes off slightly, um, not to the point that it would break his wudu, but he just dozes off and then comes to, and then he realizes the imam has now performed the prostrations and going to the standing of the following rak'ah. Or he's crowded out. Sometimes in masjids where there's a lot of people, and this happens a lot in, um, um, in especially in hajj or umrah, when people are when the, the masjids are very crowded, and you can't, uh, everybody's going into prostration and there's no place for you to prostrate. Uh, some of the people, some of the ignorant people will actually prostrate on the backs of other people. And that's uh, a mistake because he has to. You would have to wait until uh, there's a space. Even though the imam and the and the and the and the congregation has now gone to the standing position, 
if you think that you can prostrate that, those prostrations and catch up to the imam, then you would do so. So that's why he says, or if he's crowded out of performing a prostration and the imam has already stood up for another rak'ah, yet he feels he can perform the prostration before the imam bows, then he should prostrate. So if you're crowded out or if you forget to do prostrations with the imam and now the imam is standing up, if you feel that you can do both of these prostrations and then catch up to the imam before he goes in to the, the ruku' of that following rak'ah, then you would do so and then catch up to him. If he does not think that is possible, meaning he does not think he has enough time to do both prostrations properly and then catch up to the imam before he bows, he should leave those prostrations and follow the imam and then make up a miss rak'ah after the salam of the imam. So he would just skip that, those prostrations, follow the imam, and then continue on the prayer. And then at the end of the prayer, he would make up another rak'ah to replace that rak'ah where you, he had the missing prostrations. In the case of making up a rak'ah, there is no prostration of forgetfulness owed unless it, there is doubt about bowing or prostration. So when he stands up to make up that extra rak'ah, or make up uh, because of not being able to perform the prostration, or not being able to perform the rak'ah with the imam, then he makes it up, but there is no prostration owed. And the reason he's mentioning this is because a person might say, well, I've now added something to the prayer, I have to do a ba'di. He's saying, knowing in this situation, if, even though you have added something, um, there's no prostration owed, unless you had doubt about the bowing or prostration. And what that means is that if a person, um, if a person say he, um, he, 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 he thought he could catch up to the imam, after he missed the ruku' or he missed the sajjah and he thought he could catch up to the imam. So he does what's upon him and then he catches up to the imam. But when he catches up to the imam, he has doubt. He says, you know what, I don't think, I, I don't know if I got to the imam before he came out of the, the second sajjah. Like in the case of missing the ruku'. He missed the bowing with the imam. And now the imam is in prostration. So he thinks that he can do this ruku' and catch up to the imam before the imam ri raises his head from the second sajjah. But he does all that and but when he gets to the imam, now he has doubt. He says, I don't know if I, if, I, if I cut up to the imam before he raised his head. So in his case, he would add another rak'ah to this prayer, and then he would prostrate um, after the salam because of the possibility of addition. وَمَنْ جَاءَتْهُ عَقْرَبٌ أَوْ حَيَّةٌ فَقَتْلَهَا فَلَا شَيْءَ عَلَيْهِ إِلَّا يَطُولَ فِعْلُهُ أَوْ يَسْتَدْبِرَ الْقِبْلَةَ فَإِنَّهُ يَقْطَعُ Should a scorpion or snake come to someone praying and he kills it out of fear of harm, then there is no fault on him or, or uh, nor anything owing unless it preoccupies him from considerable, for considerable time or he turns his back to the qibla in such a case he breaks his prayer so if somebody during the prayer something comes a snake or a scorpion or a, a harmful spider comes to him and he um, kills it then there's no, uh, there's no fault upon him unless it preoccupies him to, for considerable time. He grabs a stick and now he, he's trying to hit it and it takes considerable time, or he's doing a lot of action, then it would break his prayer. Or in the process of, of killing the snake or the scorpion, he turns his back on the qibla, in that case he would break, um, his prayer would be broken. وَمَنْ شَكَّ هَلْ هُوَ فِي الْوِتْرِ أَوْ فِي ثَانِيَةَ الشَّفْعِ جَعَلَهَا ثَانِيَةَ الشَّفْعِ وَسَجَدَ بَعْدَ السَّلَامِ ثم أوتر ومن تكلم بين الشفع والوتر ساهيا فلا شيء عليه وإن كان عامدا كرها ولا شيء عليه whoever doubts whether he is in the odd witr prayer or the second rak'ah of his even prayer شفع then he should do a, he should consider it his second rak'ah of his even prayer and do a prostration after the salam and then perform the odd prayer if a person is in the the witr prayer he doubts whether he's in the witr or the shafi prayer the shafi and the witr are done after isha and before the dawn, it's, uh, a person would do two rak'ah nafila, the shafi', and then the one rak'ah of sunnah, and they would be both done together. But if a person is standing, and he doesn't know if he's in the witr, which is one rak'ah, or he's in the second rak'ah of his shafi' prayer, then he, cons he considers it the second rak'ah of the shafi' pray prayer, and then say salamu alaykum, and then do a prostration, and then he would pr perform the odd prayer, he would do the witr. As for the one who unwittingly speaks between the even and the odd prayer, he owes nothing. However, should he do that intentionally, while he owes nothing, it is nonetheless disliked. So, the shavr and the witr prayer, even though it's considered like it's one prayer, because it's done together, it's actually two separate prayers. There's a shavr, two rak'ahs of nafida, and then, a, and then you leave by saying, Assalamu alaikum, and then you stand up and you do the, the witr, one rak'ah, and um, with uh, fatiha, and then recitation of, قُلْ هُوَ اللَّهُ أَحَدْ قُلْ أَعُوذُ بِرَمْ بِالْفَلَقِ and قُلْ أَعُوذُ بِرَمْ بِالنَّاسِ and then you would do the tashahud and say assalamu alaikum. So between those two prayers, if a person speaks, 
They don't have to say, well, I, I accidentally spoke in my prayer. I have to do a ba'di. He says, no, you don't have to do that because in reality, you're, you're actually between two prayers. You're not in one prayer. But that's if it's done inten- unintentionally. If it's done intentionally, also there's nothing owed, but it is disliked. وَالْمَسْبُوقُ إِنْ أَدْرَكَ مَعَ الْإِمَامِ أَقَلَّ مِنْ رَاكَةٍ فَلَا سَيَسْجُدُ مَعَهُ لَا قَبْلِيًّا وَلَا بَعْدِيًّا فَإِنْ سَجَدَ مَعَهُ بَطَلَتْ صَلَاتُهُ وَإِنْ أَدْرَكَ رَكْعَةً كَامِلَةً أَوْ أَكْثَرَ سَجَدَ مَعَهُ الْقَبْلِيَّ وَأَخَرَ الْبَعْدِيَّ حَتَّى يُتِمَّ صَلَاتُهُ فَيَسْجُدُ بَعْدَ السَّلَامِ فَإِنْ سَجَدَ مَعَ الْإِمَامِ عَامِدًا بَطَلَتْ صَلَاتُهُ وَإِنْ كَانَ سَاهِيًا سَجَدَ بَعْدَ السَّلَامِ Whoever joins a congregational prayer late and does not fulfill even one complete rak'ah with the imam, then he should not do a prostration of forgetfulness with him, neither a qabli nor a ba'di. If he happens to prostrate with him, his prayer is invalid. If he does obtain either a complete rak'ah or most of it with the imam, then he should prostrate a qabli with him but delay the ba'di after, until after his own final salam. Should he intentionally prostrate a ba'di with the imam, then his prayer is invalid. If he does that unintentionally, then he should do a prostration after his final salam. So if a person joins a congregational prayer late, what they call the masbuq, and does not complete even one rak'ah with the imam, then he does not do a prostration of forgetfulness with him, neither a qabli or a ba'di. So if a person comes to a congregation and does not get one complete rak'ah, and that's defined of him being in ruku'ah before the imam comes up out of the ruku'ah, if he does not even get that, like he comes in at the final tashahud, or he comes in after the imam's risen from the ruku'ah of the final rak'ah, then he is not considered to be part of this jama'ah. So for that reason, if the imam owes a qabli or a ba'di, then he does not prostrate it with him. Because in normal situations, uh, if you uh, catch uh, something with the imam, you would prostrate the qabli or the ba'di. But if you did not catch any of the prayer, uh, if you don't, if, even if you've caught something, but you're not considered to be part of this congregation, in the sense that you don't, uh, you have not um, completed a full rak'ah or part of it with the imam, you don't do a qabli or a ba'di with him. If he happens to prostrate with him, his prayer is invalid. So if this person who has not completed one complete rak'ah with the imam, or most of it, meaning he has not got into the ruku'ah, gone into the ruku'ah before the imam comes out, then he should not do a qabli or a ba'di. He should just, after the salam of the imam, or when the imam is prostrating in the qabli, he does not do anything, and then he waits for the salam, and then he completes the, the prayer. If he goes ahead and prostrates the qabli or the ba'di, his prayer is invalid, because he has now added something to the prayer that he does not need to. If he does uh, uh, obtain either a complete rak'ah or most of it with the imam, then he should prostrate the qabli with him, but he should delay the ba'di until after his own final salam. So if he came late to the prayer, he caught the last two rak'ahs of dhuhr, and now the imam for whatever reason is prostrating the qabli, he's prostrating the two rak'ahs before the salam. For, for, the, for, the, for the person that came late, he's going to make up the rest of his prayer after the imam says the salam. But because he has a qabli, he's going to prostrate the qabli with the imam. And then after the imam says assalamu alaikum, he's going to stand up and he's going to continue his prayer. But if it's a ba'di that the imam owes, he should, the, the latecomer that's making up what he owes should prostrate the ba'di after the completion of the salam. So if he comes in to dhuhr and he's missed two rak'ah, and at the end of the prayer, the Imam says, Assalamu alaikum, and is now prostrating in Ba'di. The follower that came late, the latecomer, he stands up, he makes up what he owes, those two rak'ahs, and then after his own salam, he would do a Ba'di. Should he intentionally prostrate the Ba'di with the, the Imam, then his prayer is invalid. So, he was supposed to delay the Ba'di. If he goes now and he prostrates the Ba'di after the salam of the Imam, uh, and before he's made up his, uh, what he owes, then his prayer is invalid. If he does that unintentionally, then he should do a prostration after the salam. If a person just forgets that he owed something, and then sees the imam does a ba'di, and forgets that he should have delayed the ba'di until after the salam, and now he prostrates with the imam, then his prayer is valid, but he should, and, and then after he makes up what he owes, he should do a ba'di again. Because that first ba'di does not uh, fulfill the, um, the need of having, uh, of, of having to have done a ba'di. وإذا سهل المسبوق بعد سلام الإمام فهو كالمصلي وحده وإذا ترتب على المسبوق بعدي من جهة إمامه وقبلي من جهة نفسه أجزاءه القبلي. If a follower forgets something after the final salam of his imam, then he is considered like a solitary worshiper. If he owes his um, if he owes on his own a ba'di because of the imam and a qabli because of something he did, then a qabli suffices suffices for both. 
So if a follower forgets something after the final salam of his imam, then he is considered like a solitary worshiper. He stated earlier that while you're praying by the, behind the imam, your mistakes are borne by the imam. But once the imam says assalamu alaikum, and you as a latecomer are standing up now to make up something that you missed, or redressing a rak'ah that, that, that was deficient. Now while you're standing up, even though you got the reward of being as part of this congregation, you're now like a solitary worship. So any mistakes that you do, you have to address. Whereas when you were praying behind the imam, any mistakes that you did, uh, with certain exceptions, any mistakes that you did would be borne by the imam. If he owes his own on his own a ba'di because of his imam, and a qabli because of something he did, then a qabli suffices for both of them. So if a latecomer comes to the prayer, and his imam did something that required a ba'di. And he as a late prayer is not prostrating the ba'di with the imam, but is waiting until he completes his prayer, and then after his own prayer, he's going to do the ba'di. But while making up those missed uh, rak'ahs, he does something that requires a qabli. So now he did something that requires a qabli. And the imam did something that requires a ba'di. Then for that person, the latecomer, a qabli suffices for both. وَمَنْ نَسِيَ الرُّكُوعَ وَتَذَكَّرَهُ فِي السُّجُودِ رَجَعَ قَائِمًا وَيُسْتَحَبُّ لَهُ أَنْ يُعِيدَ شَيْءً مِنِ الْقِرَاءَةِ ثُمَّ يَرْكَعُ وَيَسْجُدُ بَعْدَ السَّلَامِ Whoever forgets to bow and remembers it in prostration, then he should return to the standing position and preferably repeat something from his recitation and then bow and prostrate for forgetfulness after the salam. So if a person forgets to go into ruku'ah, from standing position after recitation of Fatiha or the Surah, instead of going into Rukur, he immediately goes into prostration. He immediately goes into Sajda. And while he's in Sajda, he remembers that he should he, he forgot to do the Rukur. Then for him he should he, he returns to the standing position. He doesn't go from the Sajda to the Rukur. He goes from the Sajda to the standing position. And then from the standing position he would go into Rukur. But before he does that, it's recommended that he recites something from the surah. Because it's recommended that, that the ruku' come immediately after recitation of the Qur'an. So if he forgot to do the, the, the bowing, and now he went straight into the prostration, and he realized it. He stands up, it's recommended for him to recite, recite a portion of uh, a recitation of, of a surah, and then go into the ruku' and then come out of the ruku'. And then for that, he would prostrate after the salam because of this addition. وَمَنْ نَسِيَ سَجْدَةً وَاحِدَةً وَتَذَكَّرَهَا بَعْدَ قِيَامِهِ رَجَعَ جَالِسًا وَسَجَدَهَا إِلَّا أَنْ يَكُونَ قَدْ جَلَسَ قَبْلَ الْقِيَامِ فَلَا يُعِيدُ الْجُلُوسِ Whoever forgets one prostration remembers it after having standing, after, uh, re remembers it after standing, then he should return to a sitting position and perform the prostration unless he sat before the standing. In that case, he should not repeat the sitting. Now in this case, in the first case, we we're saying a person forgot the bowing and is in the prostration. Now he forgot the prostration and he remembers it after standing. So if a person goes down and he only does one prostration, and then he stands up, and while he's standing, he realizes he did not do the second prostration. Then for him, he should go back to do the prostration, but before he does the prostration, he should sit down. Because between every two prostrations is a sitting. So for example, in the, he's in subah prayer, in the morning prayer. He goes down into prostration, he prostrates once, and then he stands up. And now he begins reciting Fatiha. And he realizes that he did not prostrate that se second prostration. So he sits down, he goes to a sitting position, because there's supposed to be a sitting position between each uh, of the prostrations, and then he prostrates, and then he stands back up, and then he would do a body. Unless he sat before sitting, before standing. So if a person did one prostration, sat up, and then before doing the second prostration, he stood up. Then from the standing position, he should not repeat the sit... Uh, uh, from the standing position, he doesn't go to the sitting position. Rather, he goes immediately to the prostration. وَمَنْ نَسِيَ سَجْدَتَيْنِ خَرَّ سَاجِدًا وَلَمْ يَجْلِسْ وَيَسْجُدُ فِي جَمِيعِ ذَلِكَ بَعْدَ السَّلَامِ Whoever forgets two prostrations should immediately prostrate and not sit before it. And he should do the prostration of forgetfulness for all of that after the salam. So if a person, he, he goes from, a, uh, from after reciting uh, the Qur'an, he goes into ruku' and then comes out, and then he goes down to the prostration, but instead of prostrating, he doesn't do any prostrations, he just sits, and then he stands up. And then he realizes that he didn't even do any prostration. So for him, he doesn't sit, he immediately goes into the first prostration, and then doesn't, and does the second prostration, and then completes his prayer, and then he would prostrate after the salam for all of that. For all of these um, um, situations, 
of forgetting the prostration or forgetting the bowing or forgetting both prostrations. After he addresses that, at the end of the prayer, he would prostrate after the salam. وَإِن تَذَكَّرَ السُّجُودَ بَعْدَ رَفْعِ رَأْسِهِ مِنَ الرَّكَعَةِ الَّتِي تَلِيهَا تَمَادَ عَلَى صَلَاتِهِ وَلَمْ يَرْجِعْ وَأَلْغَى رَكَعَةِ السَّهْوِ وَزَادَ رَكَعَةً فِي مَوْضِعِهَا بَانِيًا وَسَجَدَ قَبْلَ السَّلَامِ إِنْ كَانَتْ مِنَ الْأُولَيَيْنِ وَتَذَكَّرَ بَعْدَ عَقْدِ الثَّالِثَةِ وَبَعْدَ السَّلَامِ إن لم تكن من الأوليين أو كانت منهما وتذكر قبل عقد الثالثة لأن السورة والجلوس لم يفوتا. Should he remember a misprostration after he has already raised his head from the bowing position of the rak'ah that followed the misprostration, then he should simply continue in his prayer and not return to it and simply cancel the forgot rak'ah and increase the rak'ah in his place based on what was done. So if a person missed the prostration and now between the misprostration <clears throat> and where he is is a complete rak'ah, then he continues on in the prayer. So, for example, he we said if he misses the prostration of rak'ah number one, and he realizes it before he raises his head from the bowing of rak'ah number two, then he could immediately go into the prostration and then con- and then come back up and continue on his prayer. And then he would add an extra rak'ah, and we'd prostrate after the salam as was discussed in the previous section. But say now um, he remembers he's in rak'ah number three of Dhuhr prayer, and he realized that he missed a prostration from rak'ah number one, then he's going to cancel out rak'ah number one, and add a fifth rak'ah to the prayer, building upon what was done, meaning he's not going to recite a surah, and then he's going to, he's going to prostrate. And he says, uh, building on what was done or based on what was done, because in this now, in this last rak'ah, in this uh, added rak'ah, he would not say, well, I'm performing this last rak'ah because I canceled out rak'ah number one or two. And rak'ah number one or two had a surah, so I'm going to read a surah in this fifth rak'ah. He says, no, you, you perform it without a surah. So if he forgot the prostration, and he really realized it later in the prayer, and now he's he's too far um, ahead, um, um, uh, too far ahead of it to make it up. Meaning he's raised his head from the the the, the bowing this after it. Then he continues on his prayer. He cancels out that that rak'ah, and then he adds a, a rak'ah at the end. And he would either do a qabli or a ba'di. So if the cancelled rak'ah was from the first or the second rak'ah, he would have to do a prostration before the salam because when he looks at his prayer. He's canceled out um, a, a rak'ah that had a surah, or that had a sitting in it, and a surah. So he's now con- uh, subtracted something from the prayer. If he's forgot, um, a canceled out a rak'ah from number three or four, then he would prostrate after the salam. So in the in the first example, say a person um, uh, forgets a prostration from rak'ah number one, he realizes it in rak'ah number three. He cancels out rak'ah number one. And then he adds another one. So now rak'ah number two becomes one. Rak'ah number three becomes two. Four becomes three. And five becomes four. Now when you look at the, 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 the prayer, because rak'ah number three became two, in rak'ah number three, there was no recitation of a surah. And there was no sitting. So by it becoming two, there's a missing of a surah and a sitting. And so for that reason, he would prostrate the qabli. If he remembered it in rak'ah number three or four, if he canceled out rak'ah number three or four, by him adding something, he's not missing anything. Because rak'ah, this added, this fifth rak'ah, looks the exact same as rak'ah number three or four. Because there's no surah in it. So he would do a ba'di because of the addition. So for that reason he says, he would perform the prostration before the salam if it is one of the first two rak'ahs which is remembered after the third rak'ah is performed. Or the prostration of forgetfulness should be made after the salam, a ba'di, if it is not one of the first two, meaning it's the second, uh, it's the third or the fourth, or even if it is, but one remembers before the third rak'ah is performed. So if one remembers, if one cancels out rak'ah number one or two, he does a qabli. If he cancels out three or four, he does a ba'di. Unless it's in the situation where he's canceling out rak'ah number two, but he remembers it before the third rak'ah. Because at that point, if, he, if he's in rak'ah number two, and he realizes that he's canceling out rak'ah number one, now he realizes that this rak'ah number two has become one. And then rak'ah number three has become two. So while he's in rak'ah number three, 
he's remembered that he missed something from number one, and so two became one, and there's no sunnah missed because the, the, the surah was recited in rak'ah number two and now it became one. And now he's standing in rak'ah number three and he realizes that it has become rak'ah number two. And so he's going to recite a surah and then he's going to do a sitting. And then he's going to do uh, um, another rak'ah, which is the third rak'ah. In reality, it's the fourth rak'ah, but it's, it's what we're considering the third rak'ah. And then he's going to add a fifth rak'ah, which is really the, the it's becoming the, the, the fourth rak'ah. And then he's going to do a ba'di for an addition. Uh, because he says, this is so because neither the surah nor the sittings were missed. So in that situation where he realized the mistake in the first or the second rak'ah, and he remembered it while before he... He uh, he went into the court of the uh, rukur of the third rakah. He's able to make this third rakah a complete second rakah, meaning he's going to recite the surah and he's going to do a sitting. So the surah or the sittings were not lost. So for that reason, he would do a badi because of only the addition. وَمَنْ سَلَّمَ الشَّاكِنْ فِي كَمَالِ صَلَاتِهِ بَطَلَتْ صَلَاتُهُ If someone gives the final salam while having doubts about the completion of his prayer, this nullifies his prayer. So if a person doubts whether his prayer is complete, he doesn't know that I perform three or four in Luhr. He has to address that and add another rakah and then do a ba'di. If he says assalamu alaikum while still having doubts about the completion of his prayer, then his prayer is invalid. Even if after that he realizes that his prayer in fact was, valid, uh, was complete. So if he has doubt, shek about the completion of the prayer. And then he says, Assalamu alaikum, and then afterwards he realizes, oh, actually, my prayer was uh, complete. His prayer is still invalid because at the time of saying salam, he was, he was in doubt about the completion of the prayer. The rules of redressing mistakes, the rules of sahu, applying to prayers being made up, the prayers qada are the same as those applying to prayers performed in their respective times. So whether a person is praying the prayers in their regular times or they're making them up the 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 rules regarding making the uh, addressing the mistakes are the same the rules of redressing mistakes in supererogatory prayers nafila prayers are the same as those in obligatory prayers the fard with the exception of six instances instances the fatiha the surah the silent recitation the vocal recitation and adding an extra rak'ah and forgetting some of the ob obligations and a long time passes and he's going to describe each one of uh, each one of these فمن نسي الفاتحة الفاتحة في النافلة وتذكر بعد الركوع تمادى وسجد قبل السلام بخلاف الفريضة فإنه يلغي تلك الركعة ويزيد ويزيد أخرى ويتمادى ويكون سجوده كما ذكرنا في تارك السجود. As for the one who forgets the fatiha and remembers after the bowing, he should continue and prostrate before the salam, which differs from the ruling in an obligatory prayer, in which case he would void the rak'ah altogether and do another in his stead and continue on with his prayer. Its prostration would be the same as the one who omits a regular prostration. So he says if a person forgets to, the, to recite the Fatiha in the prayer, and he remembers it after bowing, then he should continue on his prayer and prostrate before the Salam. Because, of, uh, because now he has subtracted something. Which differs from the ruling in an obligatory prayer, in which case he would void the Raka'ah altogether and do another instead and continue on with the prayer. So he's saying that... Um, a person, if he forgets to recite the Fatiha in a, in a Nafila prayer, at the end of the prayer he does a Qabli and he, uh, his prayer is sound. And this um, differs from the obligatory prayer because we know that the uh, uh, missing the uh, Fatiha in the obligatory prayer, if it's not addressed, would invalidate the prayer. So he says in the obligatory prayer, he would void that Raka'ah where he missed the Fatiha. Whereas in the, in the Fard, he would... He would. Uh, um, this ruling is in contrast to uh, obligatory prayer, where if he were to forget the Fatiha, he's saying here that he would void the Raka'ah altogether and then do another in its stead. If he forgot the, rak the Fatiha in the Fard prayer from Raka'ah number one, for example, he would void it and then add another Raka'ah and he would continue on with the prayer and his prostration would be the same as the one who omits the regular prostration. So. In the situation where, uh, in the previous section where he was talking about a person that misses the prostration and doesn't realize it, 
he would add uh, an, uh, an additional rak'ah and then prostrate a qabri if it was from rak'ah number one or two, a ba'di if it was from two or three, or a ba'di if it was from two, but he remembered it before going into rak'ah number three. So he's saying here that if a person forgets the fatiha in a fard prayer, he would cancel out that rak'ah, add another rak'ah at the end, and then either prostrate a qabli or a ba'di, depending on where the cancel rak'ah was. A qabri for rak'ah number one or two, a ba'di for number three or four, or a ba'di from number two, if it was remembered before going into the ruku' of number three. وَمَنْ نَسِيَ السُّورَةَ وَالْجَهْرَ وَالسِّرَّ فِي النَّافِلَةِ وَتَذَكَّرَ بَعْدَ الرُّكُوعِ تَمَادَ وَلَا سُجُودَ عَلَيْهِ بِخِلَافِ الْفَرِيلَةِ Whoever forgets to recite a surah or recite out loud or silently in a supererogatory prayer, a nafila, should continue on in his prayer and there's no prostration binding in contrast, in contrast to an obligatory prayer. So he's saying if a person forgets one of those three things in the nafila, there is no prostration binding upon him, meaning there's no qabli in missing a surah or no qabli in reciting silently where he should be out loud or no ba'di where, where he's reciting um, out loud where he should be silent. In contrast to the, the, the obligatory prayer, in which case he would do a qabli for missing a, a, a surah, he would do a qabli for um, not reciting out loud where appropriate, and he would do a ba'di for not reciting silently where appropriate. وَمَنْ قَامَ إِلَى ثَالِثَةٍ فِي النَّافِلَةِ فَإِنْ تَذَكَّرَ قَبْلَ عَقْدِ الرُّكُوعِ رَجَعَ وَسَجَدَ بَعْدَ السَّلَامِ وَإِنْ عَقَدَ الثَّالِثَةَ تَتَمَادَ وَزَادَ الرَّابِعَةَ وَسَجَدَ قَبْلَ السَّلَامِ بِخِلَافِ الْفَرِيضَةِ فَإِنَّهُ يَرْجِعُ مَتَى مَا ذَكَرَ وَيَسْجُدُ بَعْدَ السَّلَامِ Whoever stands for a third rak'ah and remembers before the bowing should return to the sitting position and do a prostration after the salam. But if he has completed the third rak'ah, then he should continue on and perform a fourth rak'ah and prostrate before the salam. Again, in contrast to an obligatory prayer, in which case he would return whenever he remembered and performs a prostration after the salam. So, according to the Maliki scholars, a nafila prayer is two rak'ahs, not anymore. But if a person stands for a third rak'ah in a nafila prayer and remembers before bowing, then he should return, sit back down to the sitting position, say assalamu alaikum, and then do a ba'di for that addition of standing. But if he has completed the third rak'ah, meaning now he's praying two rak'ah nafila, but he stood up for a third rak'ah, forgetting, and then he goes into ruku'ah, and that's what he means by completed the third rak'ah, meaning that he has gone into the third rak'ah, then he should continue on with that rak'ah and then perform a fourth rak'ah and then prostrate before the salam. And the reason he would prostrate before the salam is because now they're considering this four rak'ah nafila prayer to actually be two naf two uh, two two nafila uh, two two rak'ah nafilas. So because of that, that um, he has forgot. It's as if, it's as if he's forgot the taslim of leaving the first prayer and the takbir of going into the second prayer. So it's as if he subtracted something. So because he has subtracted that taslim from the first two rakahs and the tas and the takbir from the the for the next um, uh, section, he would do a qabli. Again, in contrast to an obligatory prayer, in which case he would return whenever he remembered and performs a prostration after the salam. So he said in contrast to the obligatory prayer, because if you're in an obligatory prayer and you've realized that you're now adding a, a, a rak'ah uh, above the amount that should be performed, then no matter where you are, no matter if you're standing, if you have not gone into ruku', if you have gone into ruku', if you've performed one or two, you go back, you sit down, you say salamu alaykum, and then you do a ba'di. ومن نسي ركنا من النافلة كالركوع أو السجود ولم يتذكر حتى سلم وطال فلا إعادة عليه بخلاف الفريضة فإنه فإنه يعيدها أبدا. Whoever omits a pillar from an extra prayer such as bowing or prostrating and does not remember until after a period of time has elapsed then he need not repeat the prayer which is also contrary to an obligatory prayer whereby he must repeat the prayer indefinitely. So if a person omits unwittingly a uh, a pillar of the prayer, like the, the like the rukur, the bowing, or the prostration. And he does not remember that until after he said, Assalamu alaikum, and now a long time has passed, then that prayer is invalid, it's not considered complete, but he does not have to repeat it. Because he was not careless in performing the prayer. Whereas if a person intentionally left something from the nafila prayer, and then he let a long time go, uh, go by without addressing it, he would have to repeat it. But if he uh, did it unintentionally, he said, Assalamu alaikum, and a long time passed, or he left the masjid, then the prayer is invalid, but he does not have to repeat it. 
if a long time has not passed, then he would address it. He would go. Uh, he would address that um, that ruku, that, that that pillar by doing it again and then prostrating after the salam. And this is also in contrast to a fard prayer, whereby he must repeat it indefinitely. If a person's performed a fard prayer and he forgot a pillar like the bowing or the prostration, and then he says assalamu alaikum, and then a long time passes or he leaves the masjid. That prayer would, is invalid and he has to repeat it because an obligation, obligatory prayer has to be done. وَمَنْ قَطَعَ النَّافِلَةَ عَامِدًا أَوْ تَرَكَ مِنْهَا رَكَعَةً أَوْ سَجْدَةً عَامِدًا أَعَادَهَا أَبَدًا وَمَنْ تَنَهَدَ فِي صَلَاتِهِ فَلَا شَيْءَ عَلَيْهِ إِلَّا يَنْطِقَ بِحَرْفِ Whoever leaves a nafila intentionally or omits from it a rak'ah or a prostration intentionally must repeat it indefinitely. Whoever sighs in his prayer owes nothing unless a letter is pronounced. In that case, it is similar to speech. It's intentional invalidates the prayer, and it's unintentional it requires a prostration after the salam. So if a person leaves it nafila intentionally, he, he goes into the prayer, and he cuts it off intentionally, he has no reason to cut it off. Or he omits from it a rak'ah, or a prostration intentionally, he must repeat it indefinitely. Because according to Imam Malik, if a person goes into a nafila, it's wajib upon him to complete it. وَمَنْ تَنَهَّدَ فِي صَلَاتِ فَلَا شَيْءَ عَلَيْهِ If a person sighs in the prayer, he owes nothing unless a, a, a letter is pronounced. If a letter is pronounced, like if he says, ha, and he sighs and there's a ha sound or a ha sound, then it's similar to speech. If it was done intentionally, then intentional speech invalidates the prayer, so his prayer is invalidated. And if it was done unintentionally, then it requires a prostration after the salam. وَإِذَا سَهَ الْإِمَامُ بِنَقْصٍ أَوْ زِيَادَةٍ سَبَّحَ بِهِ الْمَأْمُومِ وَإِذَا قَامَ إِمَامُكَ مِنْ رَكْعَتَيْنِ فَسَبِّحْ بِهِ فَإِنْ فَارَقَ الْأَرْضِ فَاتْبَعْهُ وَإِنْ جَلَسَ فِي الْأُولَى أَوْ فِي الثَّالِثَةِ فَقُمْ وَلَا تَجْلِسْ مَعَهُ وَإِنْ سَجَدَ وَاحِدَةً وَتَرَكَ الثَّانِيَةَ فَسَبِّحْ بِهِ وَلَا تَقُمْ مَعَهُ إِلَّا أَنْ تَخَافَ عَقْدَ رُكُوعِهِ فَاتْبَعْهُ وَلَا تَجْلِسْ بَعْدَ ذَلِكَ مَعَهُ لَا فِي الثَّانِيَةِ وَلَا فِي رَابِعَةٍ فَإِذَا سَلَّمَ فَزِدْ رَكْعَةً أُخْرَى بَدَلًا مِنَ الرَّكْعَةِ الَّتِي أَلْغَيْتَهَا بَانِيًا وَتَسْجُدُ قَبْلَ السَّلَامِ فَإِنْ كُنْتُمْ جَمَاعَةً فَالْأَفْضَلُ لَكُمْ أَنْ تُقَدِّمُوا وَاحِدًا يُتِمُّ بِكُمْ if an imam forgetfully adds or subtracts something from a, a prayer then his prayer, then the follower should say subhanallah and this is whether it's a man or a woman. So for, for according to the Maliki Madhab, for both a man or a woman, if they need to mention something to the Imam, they would say, Subhanallah. And there's opinion outside of the Madhab that, uh, that the woman would clap, but even that clapping would be that she takes the, um, the back of her, of her index and uh, a middle finger and hits the palm of her left hand. So it's not a loud clapping. But according to the Manikis, both a man or a woman would say, Subhanallah. So if the Imam adds something or subtracts something from the prayer, and you need to mention it to him so that he can address that, you would say, Subhanallah. It would be wajib upon a person amongst the jama'ah to do it. If, the, if a person realizes the mistake of the Imam and does not say, Subhanallah, then the, person's, uh, prayer who for, uh, the person who forgot to, or did not say, Subhanallah, his prayer is invalid. If your imam stands after two rak'ahs without sitting, then say subhanallah, and if he continues standing, then follow him. Whereas if he sits in the first or the third rak'ah, then stand up and don't sit with him. So if the imam is, is uh, you see him getting up from the second tashahud, from the, uh, from the, in the second rak'ah, and he looks like he's not going to be sitting down for the middle sitting, for the, uh, for the first tashahud, then you would say subhanallah, subhanallah, to try to, um, uh, remind him that he needs to sit. If he now begins standing and he's left with both hands and both knees and now he's continuing on standing, then leave saying subhanallah and follow the imam because he's left a sunnah and uh, you don't have to, um, uh, you don't ha um, by leaving the middle sitting, it does not, um, uh, it, it, for the imam, since he did it, did it unintentionally, um, you would follow him and it's not an obligation, so he would merely prostrate a qabli. Whereas if he sits in the first or the third rak'ah, then stand up and don't sit with him. So he says, so he says if the imam subtracts something like a sunnah, then you would say, uh, and in this case it was the middle sitting, you would say subhanallah to him, but if he leaves that, then you follow him. So in that instance of uh, a subtraction, you would follow the imam. In the instance if he added something, like he sat in the, first or the third rak'ah, where there shouldn't be a sitting, 
then a person would not follow the imam, he would stand up and say subhanallah. Should the imam do only one prostration and admit to the second, then alert him with tasbih. And don't stand up with him unless you fear that he will start bowing. Then in that case, follow him, but don't sit with him after, neither in the furrow, second or the furrow with rak'ah. Then when he gives his final salam, then add an extra rak'ah in the place of the rak'ah that you voided, building on what you have already done, and then prostrate, do the prostration before the salam. So he's saying if an imam, if you're in a situation where the imam does one prostration and then he forgets to do the second one, or he leaves it, then you should alert him with tasbih. Say subhanallah to try to get him to do the prostration. If he doesn't do it, you remain seated and keep saying subhanallah, subhanallah to try to get him down from the standing position to come back and do that prostration. If you feel that he's now going to go into the rukur, go into the bowing of that next rak'ah, then leave this rak'ah, follow the imam, and then continue on with the prayer. But wherever the imam the, uh, sits, you're going to stand, and wherever he stands, you're going to sit. Meaning that, say for example, you're in the first rak'ah with the imam of Luhur prayer, and he forgets one prostration. You're sitting, and you're waiting to do the second prostration. You say, subhanallah, subhanallah, to try to get him back down. If he doesn't come down, and then you think that he's going to go into the bowing of that uh, second rak'ah, of rak'ah number two, then you stand up with him, and you continue on this prayer. But you know that his first rak'ah was invalid, so now really rak'ah number two becomes rak'ah number one. So when he's sitting in what he thinks is rak'ah number two, you're going to stand back up because you know it's rak'ah number one. And then when he's not doing the middle sitting because he thinks it's rak'ah number three, and you know that it, this rak'ah number three is actually rak'ah number two because it's, everything's moved back, then you're going to sit. So in general, you're going to sit where he stands and stand where he sit. And then after he says, Assalamu alaikum, then you're going to add another rak'ah and then prostrate after the salam. And <clears throat> should you be a congregation, then it is better if you appoint someone to complete the rest of your prayer. So if it's a congregation of people and they're going to make this extra rak'ah up because the imams, one of the rak'ahs were canceled out and he didn't address it. You as a jama'ah, it's recommended that you put one person forward to complete this, uh, to complete this prayer. He's, Imam al he mentioned this opinion, but it is not the dominant opinion. The dominant opinion is that if you're praying in a prayer, and the Imam forgets one of the prostrations, and you say, subhanAllah, subhanAllah, to try to get him back, and he doesn't come back, then you go ahead and you prostrate it. And then you follow the Imam, sitting where he sits, standing where he stands, and then when he says, Assalamu Alaikum, you say, Assalamu Alaikum, your prayer is valid, and the Imam's prayer is invalid, because he didn't come back to the tasbih, the, the saying of subhanAllah by the, by the congregation. So this is one of the only situations where the imam's prayer would be invalid and the follower's prayer would be valid. وَإِذَا زَادَ الْإِمَامُ سَجْدَةً ثَالِثَةً فَسَبِّحْ بِهِ وَلَا تَسْجُدْ مَعْهُ وَإِذَا قَامَ الْإِمَامُ إِلَى خَامِسَةً تَبِعُهُ مَنْ تَيَقَّنَ مُوجِبَهَا أَوْ شَكَّ فِيهِ وَجَلَسَ مَنْ تَيَقَّنَ زِيَادَتَهَا فَإِنْ جَلَسَ الْأَوَّلُ وَقَامَ الثَّانِي بَطَلَتْ صَلَاتُهُ Should the Imam add a third prostration, then you should alert him with tasbih, but do not prostrate with him. Also, if the Imam stands up for a fifth rak'ah, then those who are certain it is needed or those who have doubt is uh, doubt it is the fourth or the fifth should stand with him. As for the one who is certain it is an addition, he should remain seated. Should the first ones remain seated and the second ones stand, then their prayer is invalid. So if the imam, we were talking, we, he mentioned if the imam forgets one prostration. What if he adds a third prostration? Then you should not, then you should alert him with tasbih. You should say subhanallah to try to get him to stop prostrating that third prostration and do not prostrate with him. So this is a reminder to the people that even though there are, um, there's a hadith that says that the imam was made there to be followed. So you should follow him in all of his actions. If he adds something to the prayer, he adds an obligation to the prayer, then you do not follow him. And if a person were to follow him, knowing that's an, that it is an addition, his prayer is invalid. Also, if the imam stands up for a fifth rak'ah, then those who are certain it is needed or those who have doubt it is, the fourth or the fifth should stand with him. So if a person, he's praying behind the imam, and now he knows the imam standing up for a fifth rak'ah, or a fourth rak'ah in the case of maghrib, or a third rak'ah in the case of subh. The important thing is that he knows he's standing up for an additional rak'ah that's not needed. If he is certain that it's needed, meaning that he knows that, um, he knows that the imam must have done something in the first rak'ah, and he's canceling it out, and now he's adding an extra rak'ah, or he has doubt about that, he doesn't know. Is the imam adding something uh, for a reason or for not? 
or you doubt, you don't know, you think it might be a fourth, uh, an extra rak'ah, but it might also might just be the last rak'ah and you weren't paying attention. So the person that's certain that that extra uh, rak'ah is needed, or he's in doubt that it's needed, he should follow the imam. As for the one who is certain it is an addition, if you are certain that you know that this rak'ah should not be performed, and it is an addition, an unnecessary addition, he should remain seated. Should the first ones remain seated and the second one stand, then their prayer is invalid. So the first ones, meaning the people that should have stood up with the imam, if they stayed seated, their prayer is invalid. The second ones, meaning the people that knew this was an addition, if he went, up, uh, went ahead and stood up, then his prayer is invalid too. وَإِذَا سَلَّمَ الْإِمَامُ قَبْلَ كَمَالِ الصَّلَاةِ سَبَّحَ بِهِ مَنْ خَلْفُهُ فَإِنْ صَدَّقَهُ كَمَّلَ صَلَاتُهُ وَسَجَدَ بَعْدَ السَّلَامِ وَإِنْ شَكَّ فِي خَبْرِهِ سَأَلَ عَدْلَيْنِ وَجَازَ لَهُمَ الْكَلَامُ فِي ذَلِكِ if the imam says the final salam before the prayer is completed, then someone behind him should alert him with tasbih. If he accepts that, then he should complete his prayer and perform a prostration after the salam. Should he, however, doubt the person alerting him, then he may ask two just persons, and it is permissible in such a case for them to speak. So if the imam says that salamu alaykum before his prayer is completed, somebody behind him, the, the followers should not say salamu alaykum with him because that would invalidate their prayer. They should say subhanallah to try to get the imam uh, to realize that he needs to finish his prayer. So he would have to say Allahu Akbar again, come back in the prayer and then complete it. If he accepts that, then he should complete his prayer and perform a prostration after the salam. If he realizes that people are saying subhanallah, subhanallah, and he needs to uh, complete his prayer, then he, he goes back into the prayer by saying Allahu Akbar. He adds, he, 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 he completes the prayer, and then after he says, Assalamu alaikum, he and the congregation would do a ba'di for the addition. Should he, however, doubt the person alerting him, then he may ask two just persons, and it is permissible in such a case for them to speak about it. So if he's praying, and then he makes mistakes, and somebody says, Subhanallah, and he doubts whether this person was actually um, really following the prayer, then he can turn, and if he can, he can, he can just uh, point to two. Um, uh, to just people, other people in the congregation, and he can kind of make a um, um, a hand signal or a face a facial expression. Is this true? And if they nod yes, and he can see them, then he follows what they say, completes his prayer, and then prostrates after the salam. And if he's not able to understand them through uh, gestures or through their saying Subhanallah, then they can speak. They can say yes. You owe two rakahs, but they would only only meant, uh, use wor the 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 least amount of words that are necessary to get the message across. وإن تيقن الكمال عمل على يقينه وترك العدلين إلا يكثر الناس خلفه فيترك يقينه ويرجع إليهم. Should he still be certain, meaning the Imam, after asking those two just witnesses, should he still be certain he completed the prayer, then he must act according to his certainty unless several people agree with the two. So if he said, Assalamu Alaikum, and then one person said, Subhanallah, and he was doubtful about that, and then he asked two just witnesses, or he uh, motioned to them, and they said, yes, you, you, your prayer is deficient, and he still doesn't believe them, he still has certainty, then he, then he acts according to his certainty, meaning that, he, does, that he, just, he doesn't have to complete his prayer, his prayer is valid. Unless several people agree with the two, if, if more people in the jama'ah or the entire co congregation, now it's five or ten people, agree, agree with them, then he leaves his certainty and he follow what they say. Because now it's come to a point where there's so many people that it's impossible for them to have um, um, got together and lied and said, let's, let's make this a, um, um, let's, let's fool the imam. So he should leave his certainty and follow with what they say. So with this, تَمَّ بِحَمْدِ اللَّهِ كِتَابِ الْأَخْضَرِ With this completes the recording of the book of Imam Al-Akhdari. وَلِلَّهِ الْحَمْدِ May Allah make us from the people that learn this and know it well and then implement it. And then spread it to the people that need to know it. And being constant in our review of this and other matters of the deen. And that we remember that the biggest uh, or the best way for a person to increase in his knowledge is to have taqwa of Allah. Because Allah says in the Quran that whoever has taqwa of Allah... Allah will teach him.